Members of the uh, Minnesota House Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee shall uh, come to order. Um, members, we're going to take up uh, House File 3856, Representative Hollins. Uh, Representative Hollins uh, moves to refer House File uh, 3856 to the Committee on Judiciary. Representative Hollins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I. I didn't really get a chance to do a great introduction last time because we were so short of time. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, reminder, we did uh, uh, hear your presentation uh, as well as uh, some testifiers. There are some further uh, testifiers here and we wanna give uh, committee members uh, time to uh, engage with you as well. Uh, but you can certainly do an introduction, uh, a proper introduction of your bill. That's uh, absolutely in order. Okay, thank you so much. And I apologize, my internet is being a little glitchy today, so I keep freezing and unfreezing. So I'm gonna try and do this fairly quickly. I've never um, had that problem, never. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Um, if you will recall, this is um, House File 3856, which is also called the Survivor's Justice Act. And um, I would like to highlight that we can really no longer ignore the pervasiveness of domestic and sexual violence. Uh, this violence occurs across gender, racial, and economic divides, and its impact is profound and lasting. And one of the impacts of this violence is a potential to create pathways to crime. And sometimes offenders are themselves victims and vice versa. Moreover, their victimhood can be causally re related to their actual offense. Um, by understanding the experiences of domestic and sexual violence can result in criminal conduct by victims is at the heart of this bill. So it does, I think we talked about the two main things it does, allowing judges to depart from applicable, applicable sentencing guidelines um, where the criminal conduct was the result of experiencing victimization and then um, granting an opportunity for resentencing to those currently serving a sentence that might've been lower if they had the benefit of this victim-centered centered departure. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to have a hearing on these incredibly important issues. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Violence Free Minnesota to provide some context to the bill. Very well. Thank you, Representative Hollins. We have uh, Katie Kramer uh, from Violence Free Minnesota. If you can uh, state your name for the record and give us your testimony. Good evening, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. I'm Katie Kramer, Policy Director with Violence Free Minnesota, the Coalition to End Relationship Abuse. We're a statewide coalition with over 90 member programs who provide advocacy and services to domestic and sexual violence victim survivors in all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I'm testifying today in support of the Survivors Justice Act, House File 3856. We have often spoken about victims and offenders as two separate and distinct populations. We know that that dichotomy is false. We know that victim survivors far too often end up as defendants themselves in, criminal, in the criminal justice system. Research shows that as many as 94% of incarcerated women have experienced domestic and sexual violence prior to incarceration. For some incarcerated survivors, early victimization can be a catalyst for behaviors that entangle them in the criminal justice system as young people. For others, the crimes that they are serving time for are directly linked to an abusive relationship coercion, and threats of violence. Victims can be caught up in the criminal justice system with charges of their own for fighting back or acting in self-defense, for keeping their children from an abuser, or for being coerced into criminal activity. In other circumstances, survivors may turn to drugs or alcohol to cope with the effects of trauma and subsequently commit crimes connected to their substance abuse. Survivors who have suffered abuse often become involved in the criminal justice system in part because of inadequate protection, intervention, and support. A significant number of the homicide victims in Violence Free Minnesota's annual domestic violence homicide report had extensive and significant criminal histories themselves. We are deeply alarmed by the rise of incarceration and supervision rates of women in Minnesota and nationally without any assessment of their victimization and without a way to respond to it effectively. Penalizing women for crimes committed in connection to the abuse that they have experienced prevents justice-involved survivors from accessing the kinds of programming and services needed to address their trauma and put them on a path to healing. The vast majority of survivors incarcerated for crimes related to their abuse have no prior history of violent behavior 
and pose no risk to public safety. Requiring courts in Minnesota to consider the role domestic and sexual violence and sex trafficking play in commission of a crime and allowing the court to consider someone already serving time for a crime they committed in connection to their own abuse to apply to have their sentence reduced is a trauma-informed and compassionate response to justice-involved survivors. The use of reduced sentences and alternatives to incarceration would ensure survivors have the opportunity to build a healthy, safe, and crime-free life. Our response to survivors who have committed a crime in connection with their experience of domestic or sexual violence or sex trafficking should prioritize access to supportive services and treatment, not punitive imprisonment and prolonged separation from family and society. We urge you to support House File 3856, the Survivors Justice Act. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Uh, next, we have uh, Jane Ann Murray. If you can uh, introduce yourself and give us your testimony, that we would uh, appreciate it. Actually, um, the testimony from the University of Minnesota Law School Clemency Clinic will come from Kendra Satoff, my uh, student who's uh, on our panel here today, and I'll be here available to answer questions. Thank you. Terrific. But uh, if, you can, if I can just get you to state your name since you're on, now on the record, you know, I want folks to know who spoke. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, my name is Jane Ann Murray, and I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, and I run its clemency clinic. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And welcome to you, Ms. Ms. Satoff. If you can um, um, introduce yourself and give us your testimony, that would be great. Thank you. And good evening, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. I am Kendra Sadoff, a 3L at the University of Minnesota Law School and a student director of the law school's clemency clinic. I am testifying today in support of the Survivors Justice Act, House File 3856. Like Representative Hollins mentioned, at the heart of this bill is the understanding that experiences of domestic abuse, sexual violence, and sex trafficking can result in criminal conduct by victims. I would like to walk through the provisions of the bill. Subdivision one defines the terms domestic abuse, sexual violence, and sex trafficking as they are in current statutes. Subdivision two requires a court to consider information that the defendant has been a victim of one of these enumerated acts and permits the court to consider the impact on the person's mental health. Courts can do this already, but this provision requires them to consider it. Subdivision three goes a step further. It says that a victim of one of the three forms of abuse or violence is presumptively amenable to probation and therefore assumes that departure is appropriate unless there is clear and convincing evidence that the person poses a risk to another person or to the public. Section three also explicitly refers to the right of victims of the crime to make statements at sentencing. They have this right regardless, but it makes sense to emphasize that here too. Subdivision four is similar to subdivision three, but focuses on durational departures. Subdivision five emphasizes that in imposing any probationary sentencing, a court should look at appropriate services for defendants. Subdivision six is perhaps the most innovative of the provisions of the bill. It creates a second look or retroactive piece. In general terms, it permits someone already serving a sentence to argue for the focused relief in this bill today. It makes clear that victims have a voice at any resentencing. It requires appointment of counsel and consideration of any evidence of rehabilitation. A judge must also balance relief against the issue of public safety. Minnesota has long been at the forefront of sentencing policy in the country. It was the first to adopt a sentencing guideline system to ensure uniform and proportionate sentences, and Minnesota's incarceration rate has consistently been one of the lowest in the nation. This bill is another opportunity for Minnesota to demonstrate leadership and her humanity in the area of sentencing reform, a cause that has support among diverse stakeholders and across party lines. We urge you to support House um, HF 3856, the Survivors Justice Act. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Satow, for your, your testimony. Um, and Representative Hollis, um, I'm all, I've also been told that uh, we have um, Ms. Nicole uh, Matthews here from the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition who can be available uh, for, for questions. Uh, with that, members, we'll open this up um, uh, for questions and, and discussion, and we'll begin with Representative Poston. 
Thank you, Chair Mariani. My question is for uh, Representative Hollins. And Representative Hollins, forgive me if you've already said this, but because this has kind of been broken up a little bit today, I, I don't recall it. It seems like there could be a significant impact on public defenders. Uh, have you asked for a fiscal note or do you know what that looks like? Representative Hollins. Thank you, Chair Mariani, and thank you, Representative Poston. That is a great question. I believe we've requested a fiscal note. I don't think we've received it back at this point. And um, you're not wrong in that I think this would have an impact, um, a fiscal impact, uh, whether or not it would be for a state agency or um, for the judiciary, we're not entirely sure at this point. But and It could well be, Representative Hollins, that if there is a public defender impact, the uh, committee with the uh, oversight of, of those accounts would, in fact, be judiciary, assuming the bill moves forward from, from here. Uh, good question, Representative Poston. Representative Poston. Thank you, Representative Hollins. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, others, uh, questions, comments? Uh, Rep uh, Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you so much, Representative Hollins, for, uh, for your work on this and to your testifiers, too. Um, I guess I just wanted to um, just sort of highlight, um, I do, I, um, I have some concerns about the, the resentencing part of this bill. The committee will hear later in the week um, a bill relating to, uh, coming out of a task force relating to aiding and abetting felony murder. And I just know from my work on that task force that resentencing issues just get super duper complicated. So I really appreciate you all working on it. And I suspect that's an area that we'll continue to be um, examining. But the other thing I just wanted to highlight that I just scratched my head a little bit about is the, the presumption that somebody is is amenable to probation, having that be automatic, as opposed to, I guess my thinking is if if we wanna take away culpability, um, I wonder if another way is just to say the person shouldn't be convicted in the first place. Um, uh, and it just seems like an interesting thing. They still have a felony on their record. And this is maybe directed maybe to the testifiers, but I'm just trying to sort of understand um, how that works. I still really support the general idea, but just trying to sort of understand how to think about that. Representative Hollins, uh, you're free to call on any of your testifiers if you wish. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Pinto. I think that's a really good point and a great question. So um, is one of my testifiers available to address that? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Representative Hollins. This is Jane Ann Murray again, and uh, thank you, Chair Pinto, for that question. Um, uh, I, I Obviously, if there is a question about actual culpability, um, that in effect the person, the, the person was so driven to commit the crime, maybe in the context of self-defense or simply temporary insanity, then that is an issue that can be raised at trial. That can be an issue raised in pre-plea bargaining to get the case dismissed. But um, realistically, most cases are settled through plea bargaining. And um, these kinds of defenses are often imperfect and wouldn't really plausibly uh, result in an acquittal at a trial or result in um, a, a plea bar, you know, a, a dismissal of the charges. So this bill isn't trying to put a thumb on the scale on the issue of dismissal, pre-trial dismissal, or um, create new defenses that could be at trial. It's focusing very specifically at the back end, at the sentencing component, um, and asking judges to really privilege or at least center that issue and encourage defense lawyers to develop the facts that uh, could exist, develop those narratives. I think it forces prosecutors to engage with that issue um, and act with their minister for justice hat on, really thinking in terms of what is the just outcome here, given the, the range of issues and the context of the crime. Uh, Chair Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that for that response. Um, and I guess I should be clear: the, the idea of having the the system and the sentence take into account the person's the, the full circumstances of the offense, including what happened to the person, um, to my mind, makes a ton of sense. I guess the part I'm struggling with a little bit, though, is with having an automatic um, result. Um, if we are in fact saying this person is culpable enough, and it would be a pretty serious crime if they if they go to prison. Uh, or would go to prison otherwise, if we say, um, you know, we're going to automatically have them not do that, um, 
they're still going to have a felony on their record. It's still going to be very serious. It, again, I, I just I wonder a little bit about having it be such an automatic thing. But um, I really appreciate uh, the structure here that the the, um, the goal of having somebody's full circumstances taken into account. So maybe I'll just leave um, leave it out there. Just that I, I'm I'm wondering a little bit about this, but I know there'll be further discussions to be had. Chair Pinto, could I just add one thing to my answer? Um, really, this is just tracking kind of guideline language that in order to get a, a dispositional departure um, at, at, before a judge under the sentencing guidelines, the judge has to find that the person is amenable to probation. So instead of there being the presumptive prison sentence, which is the situation there is today, there is a presumption that the person would be amenable to probation. But this is all counterbalanced by the judge's own careful consideration of public safety issues. And Realistically, again, we can see in many of these cases, the judges would 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 ultimately decide, regardless of the presumption in favor of probation in this case, or the presumption in favor of a durational departure, that public safety issues require me to impose the, the guideline sentence or a prison sentence. Sure, Mr. Chair, I very, very briefly, yeah, just, I was going to know, um, just, uh, Ms. Murray, as, you, as the bill continues, and just a reminder, we are the legislature, so you should not feel constrained in writing bills to have them necessarily correspond to the sentencing guidelines or anything else. So just a reminder, um, it, I, I do know that the language here is sort of within that structure, which actually did jump out at me because we don't need to be within that structure. So just as the bill continues, just a reminder that uh, the bill can be written, however, we end up we pass it in the House and the Senate and signed by the governor. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to Representative Hollins, especially for your work. Sound advice, Chair Pintle. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Neill, followed by Representative Fraser. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hollins, for the bill. Um, I, I do have some concerns, and it's interesting that Representative Pinto kind of brought that up. Um, so I, I don't know how many folks here have actually gone to Shakopee Prison. I've been there a few times to visit, to tour, to find out about what they do there, to ask about therapy. Um, I, I don't want to cast aspersions or anything, but the, the women that are there obviously are traumatized. They have a multitude of issues. If you look at the totality of people that are in our entire system, between 85 and 90% have an addiction. Many of them have co-occurring conditions. Um, and, you know, the last time I was at Shakopee, out of the 640 or so women that were incarcerated, about 110 of them had committed murder. Um, they're there because they've committed a very, very violent crime. Here's my concern. If we're going to go back and revisit uh, the sentencing that they received, my concern is also for public safety. So obviously they are victims and they have been pushed to an absolute extreme point where they committed something, an, an act of violence against another person for the most part. I mean, there are other folks there too, don't get me wrong, but typically we're incarcerating people that have been a danger to the public, have committed a violence against another person, not in totality, but let's just we'll talk about that segment. So my concern is, if they're not ready to re-enter society, that they haven't had the proper therapy, especially with, I mean, look what we've just been through. I, I'm not even sure what kind of therapeutic things that they're doing within Shakopee right now. But my concern is the silence in this bill of the, the direction that we should be doing very, very, very strong therapy with, so restorative therapy, things, things that will bring them back to full functioning if they can be. Because you know sometimes when you have so much trauma in your childhood, you know it's, it's just going to be there. Um, you learn coping techniques, you learn different things. My concern in this bill is the silence about the really high need for restorative therapy. So that's my concern. It's very similar to what uh, Representative Pinto's concern was, although mine is very specific to restoring them to be safe back in society. So that would be my concern in this bill. Representative of Hollins. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative O'Neill. I think um, we're on the same page with that. I mean, I think that's something that we would ideally like to see as well. And 
frankly, not just for people who um, are going through this particular process, but also for everybody who is being, you know, <laughs> um, who is leaving, I think, prison. I think this is, um, we know that's one of the most jarring transitions that a person can make is being incarcerated and then returning to the outside world, especially with the limitations that are frequently put upon them. So, I mean, I, I would certainly be amenable to a friendly amendment um, or looking into this with you and working on it further. But I think I, I think I speak for my testifiers in saying this is something that we all want. We want people to be successful when they are um, released and and that's our ultimate goal. I don't know if any of my testifiers have anything to add to that. Ms. Kramer, perhaps? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Halls. And thank you, Representative O'Neill, for the comment and the concern. I would say absolutely we are on the same page. I think really, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, Oftentimes there's criminal justice involvement from um, in part of survivors because of inadequate protections, interventions and supports, right? So I think um, that absolutely this should be accompanied by really an investment in community-based programming um, and treatments, right? So that folks really can be uh, successful. And then I'll also just share that the vast majority and not all, but the vast majority of survivors incarcerated for crimes related to their abuse have no prior history of violent behavior. And, and pose no risk to public safety. And of course, judges will continue to have discretion uh, about the risk to public safety, but certainly uh, supports in it, uh, are really, really critical uh, to folks recovering from, from trauma. So thank you for that. I'm thinking particularly, Ms. Kramer, of those who sentenced under our felony murder law, um, where you know the individual is not the person who physically committed the heinous uh, act uh, as much as arguably um, was coerced to uh, participate in some way uh, short of committing a physical act. Uh, we will be hearing a, a bill later uh, this week um, uh, on that, but we've had um, quite a bit of, of testimony over the last several years about those uh, instances. Um, uh, I think all our testifiers have been women um, in relationships that, that um, have been uh, terribly relationships of, you know, incredible control and deception, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, but it's a, it's a great uh, line of inquiry, uh, Representative O'Neill, and I'll, I'll certainly call on you again if you have any, anything else to add. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that was just my concern. And, you know, if we're going to reimagine uh, criminal justice, we need to look at all of the aspects of how what makes someone successful when they either are not incarcerated and go on probation or are incarcerated and come back out. So I just wanted to make sure that we're thinking about it in totality. Indeed. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, Representative Fraser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Representative O'Neill and Representative Pinto, thank you for talking about that restorative piece. I, I remember back when I was a public defender, I actually had some prosecutors laugh at me a couple of times when we were talking about the rehabilitative um, process of, of going to prison. Um, and so those are things that vitally we need in our system so that people can be successful when they come out. But you know, the, the comment I want to make or the question I want to uh, maybe pose to the author and some of the testifiers that, you know, uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Pinto, mentioned the retroactivity piece and the fact that it could be difficult to, to possibly implement that and go back. You know, my concern, my concern with having concern about the retroactivity piece and it being difficult to implement is that we have a system that is uh, statistically proven to be inequitable and disproportionately so toward poor people and people of color. And if we don't have the ability to implement some policy change and do it retroactively, we're allowing those individuals that are, that are already currently suffering to continue to suffer without any help for them and without creating any real justice um, within this system. So, I, I mean, I'll ask, I hope you all are still figuring out ways to make that work because I think that's a vital important piece of this work that we're doing when we're talking about implementing policy to fix the harms we've done in the past and create a more equitable system. Thank you, uh, Representative Fraser. Uh, Representative Hollins, I'll turn to you for uh, closing comments and then uh, we'll take up your motion to refer to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and I, I want to thank uh, Representative Frazier for, or Vice Chair Frazier, for those comments. I think um, when we look at a bill with retroactivity, I understand that it is it is challenging and it's not something that we do on a regular basis. But that being said, um, we know that we've made some mistakes in the past and some of the sentencing guidelines that we've used and some of the, um, you know, laws that have been implemented have have 
not resulted in the way that we wanted them to. And I don't think there's any shame in looking at that and saying, okay, how do we fix this? How do we restore these individuals as best we can to make sure that they're contributing members of society? So um, I, I do ask for a yes vote um, on this. And I really thank you all for your time. I know this is a challenging topic and I appreciate the way that um, our committee members have really wrapped their, their heads and hearts around it. So thank you so much. And thank you to my testifiers. Thank you, uh, Representative Hollins. Representative Hollins renews her motion that um, House File, we did not amend this at any point, no, we didn't, that House File um, 3856 be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani? Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Frazier? Aye. Vice Chair Frazier, aye. Rep. Johnson? Uh, no, at this time. That these work. Rep, John Rep. Johnson, nay. Rep. Edelson? Aye. Rep. Edelson, aye. Rep. Feist? Aye. Rep. Feist, aye. Rep. Grossel? No. Rep. Grossel, nay. Rep. Hollins? Aye. Rep. Hollins, aye. Rep. Hewitt? Aye. Rep. Hewitt, aye. Rep. Cleavorn? Cleavorn, aye. Rep. Cleavorn, aye. Rep. Long? Aye. Rep. Long, aye. Rep. Lucero? Lucero, no. Rep, Rep Lucero, nay. Rep Mueller? Mueller, no. Rep Mueller, nay. Rep Novotny? Novotny, no. Rep Novotny, nay. Rep O'Neill? O'Neill, no. Rep O'Neill, nay. Rep Pinto? Aye. Rep Pinto, aye. Rep Poston? No. Rep Poston, nay. Rep Raleigh? Raleigh, nay. Rep. Raleigh, nay. Rep. Vang? Aye. Rep. Vang, aye. Rep. Shung? No, aye. Rep. Shung, aye. With 11 ayes and eight nays, that concludes roll call. Very well. With 11 ayes and eight nays, the motion does prevail. And House File 3856 is referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you, Representative Hollins. Uh, members, next we have Representative uh, Mueller, House File uh, 3308, and um, I'll turn to my vice chair for a motion to uh, refer to the general register. The move, Mr. Chair. Very well. Uh, Representative uh, Mueller, uh, House File 3308 is before us with a motion to refer to general register, and I believe you have an A1 amendment. Is that correct? Do you wish to move that? That's uh -huh. correct. Yep, that's correct, Mr. Chair, that we do have an A1 amendment. All right, uh, Representative Frazier, if I can um, uh, bug you again to uh, make that motion, um, I'd appreciate it. You may, so move, Mr. Chair. Very well, the A1 amendment is before us. Uh, Representative Muller, uh, tell us about the amendment. Yeah, the A1 amendment was actually something that uh, GOP researcher John Holtquist discovered. Um, we, we had something incorrect in one of the how we described the council here as a uh, juvenile commission instead of the council. And so it's making that correction. So basically a technical amendment uh, as I- as Correct. I that. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> very well, uh, discussion members. Uh, Representative Johnson, you okay with a voice vote on this? Absolutely. <clears throat> very well, thank you. Uh, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Excuse me, opposed, same sign. Motion prevails, and the A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Bowler to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And also, I have another, um, the same language was in a different provision of the bill, and our amazing House researcher, Mr. Diebel, found that. And I'm wondering if the um, committee would entertain a verbal amendment to fix that other and, part. And, uh, and Representative uh, 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 Muller, the amendment, then why don't you tell us what the amendment is? Yeah, so the amendment would be the uh, exact same language that is in the A1 you just adopted, but on it would be on page two, line 26. You would delete, quote, interstate commission for juveniles, close quote, and insert, quote, state advisory council for the interstate compact on juveniles, close quote. All right, let me turn to our legal counsel, um, Mr. Diebel, for, um, to, I guess, just confirmation of, of uh, what this oral amendment um, 
um, is and if it's a functional <laughs> oral amendment. Baron members, yes, that's a duplicate. It was just another reference to the same language. So it would uh, put the bill in the form the author would like it. Very well, Representative Johnson, I'm, my understanding is I've been informed that you, you've had some conversations about this, you're aware of this, and uh, I would uh, defer to you um, if you are okay with a, a oral amendment. We tried not to do those, uh, um, but we have reserved the, you know, the right to do them, particularly for I think, you know, really much more technical and obvious fixes to bills. Uh, Chair, Chair Mariani, uh, I have been contacted and we've been in conversation, but uh, the oral amendment is uh, perfectly fine at this time. Very well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Debo. The voice vote is fine. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, if Mr. Debo, if I can just uh, um, impede on you again to then read us what that oral amendment uh, would be and um, and then we'll uh, that that will be for the record the uh, the amendment that we'll be voting on. I apologize, my my screen is not coming up. So I, if if Representative Moeller, she had the citation it was two point two six, I believe, but she has the exact language. If she could, oh, uh, very well, that. okay, I Repres defer to her. Very well, Representative Moeller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So on page two, line 26, delete Interstate Commission for Juveniles and insert State Advisory Council for the Interstate Compact for Juveniles. Very well. Um, all in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 The poll, same sign. Motion prevails. Um, and your bill is further amended. Representative Muller, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee. I'm keeping you all on your toes after a long day. Appreciate you your patience with this. <laughs> so members, the Interstate Compact for Adult Offender Supervision regulates the interstate movement of adults on probation and supervision. It's enacted in every state and Minnesota has an advisory council of which I'm an appointed member. The council works with the national governing body to ensure compliance with the compact and is also required by statute to issue an annual report. Similarly, the Interstate Compact for Juveniles regulates the interstate movement of juveniles under court supervision or who need to be returned to home states as runaways um, or as a juvenile delinquent. It too is enacted in every state and Minnesota has an advisory committee. In Minnesota, as in other states, the advisory council and advisory committee are combined and act as one council to oversee implementation of both the adult and juvenile compacts. When I was first appointed by the speaker as a member of the advisory council and attended my first meetings, I was surprised to see so many other legislators attending the meetings um, as well. So the other appointees are Senator Limmer, Senator Bigham, Representative Hollins, Representative Johnson, Representative O'Neill, and myself. I found out that we had so many legislators on the um, committee because separate appointments under current law must be made for both the adult and juvenile councils, even though the meetings and work are actually combined. The council has recommended this bill in order to streamline membership and codify current practice where the meetings of councils are held jointly and they provide one report covering both adults and ju juveniles that's submitted annually. And I have one testifier here, Mr. Chair. Very well, I see uh, Tracy Hardlick, uh, if you can come forward, state your name for the record and give us your testimony, we would appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. I'm Tracy Hooterlich the Interstate Director at the Minnesota Department of Corrections. I'm here to provide background on House File 3308. Um, it will be probably some of the same information that Representative Mahler just provided. Um, it's a clarifying and technical bill on behalf, and, and I am representing the Advisory Council for the Interstate Compact for Adult Supervision and the Interstate Compact for Juveniles. The Advisory Council usually meets twice per year and, and as Representative Mahler indicated, it presents a report to the legislature on March 1st of each year. The membership includes representation from the judicial branch, the DOC community and victims representatives, as well as the legislators as indicated by Representative Mahler. Um, for background, the state of Minnesota participates in the National Adult Supervision and Juvenile Super Interstate Compacts. This, these compacts provide uniform guidelines to regulate the movement of probationers and parolees across state lines. The compacts are enacted in all 50 states to promote effective supervision strategies consistent with public safety, 
victims' rights, and in the case of juveniles, to help ensure the welfare of the child is consistently preserved. In 2002 and 2010, respectively, the Minnesota legislature enacted statutes governing the Interstate Compact for Adult Supervision, that was 2002, and later in 2010, the Interstate Compact for Juvenile. Both the Adult and Juvenile Compact language requires the state to have an advisory council. However, current statutory language for, for both is vague in regard to who specifically must serve on the council. It appears that current statutory language was adopted from the national language regarding the compact in general terms and was not specific to Minnesota. Since the adoption of these compacts, Minnesota has convened only one advisory council for both the adult and juvenile compacts. They are combined, similar to how some other states operate. However, this practice is not spelled out in our current statute. <clears throat> Through House File, uh, 3308, the Advisory Council proposes an update to statute to provide clarity regarding membership and to remove unnecessary language. The changes are technical in nature to align uh, current Minnesota statute with the council makeup and process to ensure appropriate and adequate representation that is mandated in law and the bodies may operate as one with a dual purpose. The bill language does the following. It combines the council members of the Interstate Council on Adult Supervision with the membership of the Interstate Commission for Juveniles. It clearly articula articulates the additional standing members that have been included in the council for years. Um, and it adds in the victims group representation that is already required by statute. And it explicitly combines the reporting requirements for both councils, which in practice, the council has been doing for years as well. Thank you for consideration of the bill, and I'm available for questions. Very well, thank you, Ms. Hudulik. Um, Representative Molo, I think that's all you have for testifiers. Um, so why don't we open this up for discussion uh, with the uh, committee members. Representative Valley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the author, um, how do you see the two organizations, the two councils uh, coming together? What, what's gonna be the process to determine who's gonna be on the combined council? Cause I know we've got assignees from uh, the legislature and, and I'm just wondering what that process is. Representative Muller. So, um, so Mr. Chair and Representative Raleigh, so the language in the bill, it's, um, it's they're going to mirror each other. So it, it'll be the, um, I don't remember if it's the speaker who appoints, um, the speaker was the one who appointed in the house. Um, and if you look at line, so this language we didn't change. So line 1.14 oh. um, describes who, who gets selected. Um, and then 1.16, so the 1.14 is the Senate and 1.16 is, is from the House. So the idea is that we would just have that representation that's not duplicative for both adults and juveniles. Representative Raleigh. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, any others? All right. Well, Representative Mueller, take us out here. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair and members. Yes, I love working with so many different colleagues, but it did seem uh, sort of strange to have so many legislators on this um, on the council. The council does really great work, and I am happy to um, to carry this bill and ask for your support. Thank you. And thank you for your work on the council and um, I extend the uh, gratitude to our colleagues as well. Uh, very well. So uh, Representative um, Fraser renews his motion that House File 3308 as amended be referred to the General Registry. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Fraser. Aye. Vice Chair Fraser, aye. Rep Johnson. Aye. Rep. Johnson, aye. Rep. Edelson? Aye. Rep. Edelson, aye. Rep. Feist? Aye. Rep. Feist, aye. Rep. Grossel? Rep. Grossel? Aye. Rep. Grossel, aye. Rep. Hollins? Aye. Rep. Hollins, aye. Rep. Hewitt? Aye. Rep. Hewitt, aye. Rep. Cleavorn? Cleavorn, aye. Rep. Cleavorn, aye. Rep. Long? Aye. Rep. Long, aye. Rep. Lucero? Chair, yes. Rep. Lucero, aye. Rep. Mueller? Mueller votes yes. Rep. Mueller, aye. Rep. Novotny? Novotny, aye. Rep. Novotny, aye. Rep. O'Neill? O'Neill, aye. 
O'Neill, aye. Rep Pinto? Aye. Rep Pinto, aye. Rep Poston? Aye. Rep Poston, aye. Rep Raleigh? Raleigh, aye. Rep Raleigh, aye. Rep Vang? Aye. Rep Vang, aye. Rep Shong? Shong, aye. Rep Shong, aye. With 19 ayes and zero nays, that concludes roll call. Very well, with 19 ayes and zero nays, uh, the motion does prevail and House File 3308 as amended is referred to the General Register. Thank you, Representative uh, Moeller, and uh, best wishes to you with your, with your bill as you move out and face the whole crew uh, uh, soon. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, members, we are now on House File um, 1355. Uh, this is Representative Gomez, um, and I'm going to um, impinge on my um, our vice chair again to make a motion to um, refer House File 1355 to the Committee on Transportation. So moved, Mr. Chair. Very well. Um, Representative Gomez, your bill, uh, House File 1355, is before us. Um, I believe you have a DE1 uh, amendment. Do you wish uh, to have us move that at, at this time? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Very well. Representative Frazier, would you do us the, uh, the honor of moving the DE1 amendment? Yes, I will. So move, Mr. Chair. Very well. Uh, the, the, amendment, uh, the amendment motion uh, is before us. Um, it's a DE1, so I suspect uh, Representative Gomez has put the bill in the shape you wanted before us at this moment. It does, Mr. Chair. Happy very to well. go into the details in the main bill presentation. Okay, very well. Uh, Representative Johnson, voice fault? That would be fine. All right, very well. Thank you, sir. Uh, all in favor um, of adopting the DE1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. And uh, House File 1355, as amended, is before us. Representative Gomez, to your bill. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for mm -hmm. hearing this bill. Um, so the bills that I have in front of you today deal with... Um, cannabis. This first one is, it's kind of like decriminalization cleanup is the way that I think about it. Um, it has a, a number of different parts that I'll kind of walk us through in a sec. But um, just for a little bit of context, so like in, in the 1970s, um, Minnesota decriminalized uh, flower cannabis. Uh, so 42 and a half grams, which is about an, which is an ounce and a half, um, is considered a petty misdemeanor. Um, in Minnesota. And I mean, just, you know, before that, I, I guess, I think that it's been interesting seeing the, um, the evolution of this issue over the time that I've been just an adult and paid attention kind of to pol political things. Um, because I think more and more, it has come out that the policy of cannabis uh, prohibition, in particular, has had more negative outcomes than benefits. It has not fulfilled the goals of prohibition, which are about protecting public safety and making sure that kids don't get access to it. None of those things have actually happened. What it has meant is that a lot of people um, who are using a substance that's much less dangerous than alcohol, than tobacco, than pharmaceuticals, than a lot of products that we have access to as adults, um, it criminalizes people for, for making the choice to use, to use this substance and, um, and has had just a lot of negative consequences. Um, and so in our wisdom in the seventies, we said, Hey, if you have a personal amount of cannabis, we don't want you to go to jail. We don't want to charge you with a felony. We're going to make, you know, a personal amount, a petty misdemeanor. The problem is that it didn't include any other form of cannabis, any concentrate. So more and more, uh, you know, if your kids or your like friends, uh, you know, consume cannabis, they're most likely not consuming it in flower form. Um, people are vaping it. They're eating it via edibles or tinctures. Um, and every amount of any cannabis concentrate. So any like non-flower cannabis product above a quarter of a gram constitutes a felony. Um, so if you have one like dose of cannabis, 
that is in a non-flower form, then you are carrying a felony around with you. Um, you I'm sure in this, um, in this committee, um, you guys talk a lot about the collateral consequences of felony convictions. And so we know that if you're convicted of a felony, it impacts your life in a lot of different ways. It can make it so that you don't have access to student loans, um, that you don't have access to housing. Um, and in, in this case uh, of cannabis, maybe that your driver's license has been revoked. Um, another kind of issue is that still in our statutes, even though we have decriminalized it in some ways, um, cannabis or a possession of a small amount of marijuana um, constitutes what's known as a crime of violence. And if you are convicted of a crime of violence in Minnesota, then you do not have access to your Second Amendment rights. Um, also, possession of cannabis, um, a, a felony possession of cannabis can constitute like a first strike under a federal three strikes law. So, you know, there are, of course, when we have felony um, penalties, there are, you know, externalities, collateral consequences. And so I'll just get, get into what the bill does um, briefly, but I did, oh, I wanted to mention just in terms of like the trend of, the way the the kind of way that people are consuming cannabis in 2013, the our drug tr drug task task forces seized 353 grams of non flower cannabis, and eight years later in 2021, they they seized 580,533 grams of edibles and 91,000 THC vape cartridges. So it's really like we, we need our laws to catch up with what's actually happening on the ground in our communities, which is that more and more people are consuming cannabis in these other ways. So just quickly what the bill does, um, it reduces penalties for a possession of those small amounts, personal amounts of concentrates, the products that I talked about, um, up to eight grams and makes it a petty misdemeanor, which is equal with the, the ounce and a half of flower, of flower cannabis um, standard. Uh, it removes the requirement that somebody um, complete a drug education program and has have their driver's license revoked um, if you have a small amount or give away a small amount of cannabis. Um, it allows the expungement of records for people with felony um, charges if it would no longer be a felony after this bill becomes law. So somebody who currently has a felony for a concentrate, if we are to adopt this, they would they would be cleared afterwards just because it kind of aligns with the direction that, that we're going in here. Um, it excludes the possession of a small amount of marijuana from the definition of crime of violence. So it provides a path to restore Second Amendment rights um, to those convicted of um, cannabis possession reduces penalties for um, some first time offenders who possess more than the petty misdemeanor limit, so over an ounce and a half. And then the last couple things are included in the A1, so, or I mean the DE, so they're not in the underlying um, version of the bill, which I think we've heard before in this committee, um, which is that, I mean, it changes the enactment date on the original bill and then provides an affirmative defense for possession of cannabis for people who are um, registered participants in Minnesota's medical cannabis program, and also for those who are enrolled in a medical cannabis program in another state. Um, so that's the bill. And um, that's my intro is done. Thank you. Very well. Thank you, uh, Representative Gomez. <clears throat> you do have two testifiers. Um, I'll call them forward. Um, uh, Andrew Schmitz. You can um, uh, um, state your name for the record and give us your testimony. We'd appreciate it. Hi, my name is Andrew Schmitz. I'm the chair of the Republican Liberty Caucus in Minnesota. I've been active in Republican politics for 10 years. Uh, the Republican Liberty Caucus is the official MNGOP uh, affiliate group or an official MNG affiliate group active since 2003. We promote limited government within the Republican Party of Minnesota. The Republican uh, Liberty Caucus of Minnesota supports this bill to partially decriminal decriminalize cannabis. 
Uh, we support limited government and oppose state intervention in people's lives unless absolutely necessary. Uh, we find it absurd and draconian that people can be charged with felonies simply for, for possessing small and moderate amounts of, of marijuana. Uh, we ask that you correct this with HF 1355. Uh, and also personally, as someone who's never used marijuana in any form, I also find it draconian and wrong that we are giving people felonies for possessing small and moderate amounts of marijuana. Thank you, committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Schmitz. If you could hang around for a bit for a question, possible questions, I would appreciate it. Uh, next Absolutely. we have, uh, thank you. Next we have uh, Thomas uh, Gallagher. If you can state your name for the record and give us your testimony, we would appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Tom Gallagher. I'm on the board of Minnesota Normal, which is the Minnesota chapter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, um, which has chapters all over the world now. And um, I'm also a criminal defense attorney in Minneapolis. I'm in Uptown Minneapolis, and I'm a constituent of Representative Long. Um, and I thank everybody for uh, letting me speak on this bill today. And Representative Gomez, the author especially. Um, I wanted to touch on five different aspects of the bill that I think are important um, to highlight. One is that it would update the, update the small amount of marijuana definition to include non-flower marijuana. And as Representative Gomez said earlier, that is important because in the 70s, people primarily were using flower form marijuana, but nowadays it's kind of the other way around. Now people are primarily using uh, vape cartridges, edibles, and things of that nature. And so the, you know, as a criminal defense attorney, I talk to people who get in trouble with the police as well as their parents and other people who just are incredulous. They cannot believe that, you know, for two cart, two little tiny glass carts, vape cartridges, um, that they're looking at a felony for that and all that comes with it. So this, this bill would fix that problem. And it still retains the principle of uh, more quantity has more consequences. It's not legalizing, it's, it's uh, reforming and uh, fixing the small amount decriminalization statute. And then the next, the next thing that I would highlight is uh, related, it's a, what I would uh, call a fix or repair of the small amount of marijuana uh, law that actually is a flaw that goes back to the original law, which has provisions about drug education requirements that the court could impose and things of that nature beyond just the definition of a petty misdemeanor. Um, I've never seen, I don't think I've ever seen it. If I did, maybe once or twice in 30 plus years, I've been a criminal defense attorney. I've never, I don't think I've seen a court impose the education requirement uh, before, but it is in the statute. And the federal courts in United States versus Foote use that to deny the defendant um, what's called the safety valve which is a legal mechanism to get around a mandatory minimum. So he ended up going to prison for more than 10 years because he had a Minnesota petty misdemeanor, so-called supposedly petty misdemeanor non-criminal conviction. So the federal courts don't believe the Minnesota statute. And I think that's enough reason for us to try to fix it. And the way to fix it is to, or I believe the way to fix it is to change the, uh, the statute, the small amount of marijuana violation statute so that the penalty does reflect a, a true petty misdemeanor. In other words, it does conform with Minnesota statute 609.02 subdivision 4A, which is a fine of up to $300 only and nothing more than that. And also um, the bill would delete enhancement for a second um, small amount of marijuana violation, which I think could also help the federal courts avoid sending people to prison for a prior record of, of, of a, a Minnesota petty misdemeanor small amount violation. And third, the third thing that I would highlight is the uh, 
basically a new expanded gross misdemeanor provision, that's, which is relatively new. The quarter gram provision is from, I think, maybe four years ago or something like that. But um, this bill would expand that to basically double the small amount quantities so that if you had up to twice the small amount quantities for flour or non-flour, that that would now be a gross misdemeanor rather than a felony. And that kind of reminds me of a bill that the Minnesota County Attorneys Association uh, was backing a couple of years ago that uh, didn't pass, but I think it's interesting that they supported this general concept in the past. And then the fourth issue I would uh, draw attention to in this bill is an affirmative, affirmative defense for, for people who are charged with marijuana crimes who claim that it was for medical reasons that they possess marijuana. And those would be people who, I have had clients who have had medical marijuana cards, they were lawful medical patients from another state and they happen to be in Minnesota for whatever reason visiting and they get uh, pulled over and there's marijuana and, and then they get charged with a felony for maybe, you know, sometimes it's two carts or something very trivial. And now they're looking at a felony in Minnesota and they can't believe it because they're legal in some other state and the Minnesota courts won't respect that because the law in Minnesota doesn't respect that. So at least this would be an affirmative defense. It might be better to have uh, a reciprocity provision, but an affirmative defense would be uh, a good thing. And then also people who, um, they, they're not part of the, they, they may be Minnesota residents, they're not part of the medical cannabis program, but they maybe get into the medical cannabis program after they get arrested. And arguably they should be treated differently or at least allowed to tell the jury about it because under State versus Hansen, a 1991 Court of Appeals, I believe it was case, um, they said, we can't even tell the jury the truth about the situation, you know, and which they call an affirmative defense. We can't even bring that up. So this, the statute would fix that. And then lastly, the fifth, topic or subtopic I would highlight in the bill relates to gun rights. And on this one, the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus has uh, submitted a letter of support. I'm a proud member of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Um, and what that would do, it, this provision would do is for people who have been convicted in the past or had been convicted in the past of a uh, felony crime of violence, which happened to be a marijuana crime, that would be a non-felony under the terms of this, of the gross misdemeanor provision that I mentioned earlier, that they would be able to go to court and um, get their gun rights restored uh, because, because of that. Uh, because that it's, it basically is a retroactivity that would help out if some people with their gun rights, if under the new law, they wouldn't have lost their gun rights. So that, that's my summary of it. And I hope, I hope the committee will uh, pass the, the, the bill. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Uh, uh, quite helpful uh, translation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Gomez, I don't see any other testifiers, so uh, we'll open this up for uh, committee uh, questions and comments and debate, and we'll begin with uh, Representative Luceno. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to the, the bill author, I appreciate this conversation. I think there are many things that we... So, uh, that are... Representative Luceno, I, I apologize to you, sir. Um, I just now noticed there's a Ryan Hamilton, um, I believe, wants to offer public testimony. Is that is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. If you can come forward, uh, sir, give us your name and your uh, testimony and then we'll uh, move back to Representative Lucero. Representative Lucero, I apologize. I, I didn't uh, catch. No, no worries. All right, very well. Uh, welcome to the committee, sir. Thank you for catching me, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ryan Hamilton, Government Relations Associate for the Minnesota Catholic Conference, the public policy voice of the Catholic Church of Minnesota. House File 1355 proves that there are better ways and full legalization and commercialization to address any unjust collateral consequences that are resulting from our current marijuana laws. So we are not opposed to targeted measures such as this. We hope that Representative Gomez 
and proponents will continue to work in good faith with all stakeholders to reform our marijuana laws to be fair and just, while also guarding against the promotion of drug use. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Appreciate your presence here with us today. Uh, Representative Lucero, uh, back to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was just uh, going to uh, make a few words to the bill author, uh, Representative Gomez. I appreciate this conversation. It's very important. There are many aspects in this bill, and that's what makes this such a good conversation. I think uh, many of these are uh, very healthy for us, again, to discuss as policymakers and Minnesota as a whole. I There are some areas that I, I'm, I want some more clarity on, and I do have uh, some potential issues with, uh, but I'm leaning toward supporting this, at least here in committee. I make no commitments on the floor, but again, I, I just appreciate the the, the very productive conversation. Thank you, uh, Representative Lucero. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, next we have Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Gomez. I just have a couple quick questions, Representative Gomez. Help me understand. I'm kind of in the same spot as Representative Lucero. Um, when you talk about small amounts, for example, THC oil, and you can have THC oil, as you know, that's as high as a 97% concentration, which is very, very potent, um, just as one example. Very, very different than one little gummy, right? It's um, very concentrated. Can you explain, like, um, what what is considered a small amount of marijuana? So if you've got a THC cartridge that is 97% THC oil, how much of that, like, how do you figure out what's a small amount of marijuana? That's what I'm struggling with. Representative Gomez. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the question, Representative O'Neill. It, it's a good one, and you kind of got at the, the challenge, I think, in, in trying to come up with um, a weight-based kind of limit, which lines up with what we did with flour in the 1970s. Um, Right, because you, you can have substances that are both considered concentrates of cannabis and a gummy will have like a small amount of active ingredient and a bunch of sugar and like gelatin-y and stuff. And then, um, you know, yeah, like an oil that's a really pure form. And so, um, as I recall, the way that we got to eight grams, um, which would basically be eight cartridges of, of oil, I mean, because most of them are about are a gram, um, is that they took sort of the amount of active ingredient in the in the petty misdemeanor limit for flour and tried to translate it roughly into what like the equivalent of a concentrate would be. Um, so that's not perfect. And I think if if like an is an ounce and a half of flour cannabis like more or less uh, sort of uh, contain more or less of the intoxicating substance than eight cartridges. Hard to say. Probably the cartridges have the most amount of THC. The flour, 42 and a half grams of flour would have an in-between amount. And then like eight grams of an edible or a gummy would have a relatively small amount. So it's definitely an imperfect... Um, you know, I mean, maybe ideally there'd be like a lot more nuance to it, but we kind of tried to make it pretty simple so that we weren't putting, um, you know, anybody who was doing enforcement on this in the position of like having to test the purity of a substance, which not all um, agent, not law enforcement agencies would have access to. I mean, I guess that, you know, they all would at some level, but do you want to send a gummy at great expense to the public to be tested for purity to a lab in order to establish whether it should be a petty misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor or a misdemeanor. You know, so I guess I, um, I'm i open to suggestions if that's not like a good approach, but that's kind of, that's what we did. Um, yeah. Fair enough, Representative O'Neill. Thank you. So that highlights, uh, that's the crux of my concern because you could have one cartridge or whatever you want to call it of 97% THC oil. That's probably the equivalent of, I don't know, how many pounds of marijuana leaf or of flour. I mean, 
pounds and pounds and pounds. So oh, no, it, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll wait until oh. you're done. But I don't, I don't think that's true. I'm sorry. I thought I had mine. So, well, okay. So the, the problem is how do people interpret the law? How do we enforce the law? How do we know what is safe and what is not? Um, so we, we've got a great trooper, I won't name him, but he is now working in our chamber and I did a ride along with him. And we happened to run into his son, who's also a trooper, who in his trunk had a big vial of THC oil that was 97% THC, which is enough to knock your socks off for a really long time, right? That That's very, very different than a bag of gummies. When you take a gummy or two gummies, that's very different than this big cartridge of 97% THC. Uh, the safety is very different on the roads, which is what their concern was. Um, my concern is there's not enough nuance in this particular level. So just eight grams, I mean, eight grams of THC oil, that's 97% and eight grams, the gummy, totally different, completely different. So um, they're, they're not the same, we're talking about public safety, they're not the same level of safety if someone's not knowing what they're doing and they're on the roads and they're highly intoxicated. Um, the other problem is, how do we do this with our traffic laws and intoxication laws? Because we don't really have a way to test um, intoxication levels with THC. That's a constant problem. So anyway, so there's a lot of problems, I think, moving this direction. I just don't think this bill is nuanced en enough to really consider all the different variables of different consumables of um, marijuana and THC products. So I. After you explained it, now I really have concerns. I'm sorry to say. Representative Gomez, I, I, yeah. I do think that you, you've been very straightforward about just exactly the the complexity of how we're trying, you know, not just here, but how we, you know, uh, from the very beginning. I mean, it does seem to me that uh, you can have different potencies of flower marijuana, you know, based on whether it's naturally grown or it's, you know, uh, produced, you know, in a you know, in a lab um, and environment. Uh, and yet we, we're still using a weight-based system uh, yeah. for that. So I, I, boy, I, you know, I'm just kind of learning a lot here. And it seems like, you know, there's just this big universe of, of variation that already exists. And I think it speaks to the issue of, you know, so what are the proper guardrails uh, if we're just not going to do like the big extremes, you know, that wind up, you know, uh, damaging the, the lives of, you know, pretty innocuous uh, behavior. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you respond. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think that's right. You know, you could say that about literally any controlled substance, I think, and our, our weight-based um, limits are the way that we, in the across the board with controlled substances, deal with criminal penalties. So you could say, like, you can have much different levels of purity of cocaine, of heroin, of whatever. But if you have a gram of a thing that tests positive for heroin, then you're charged with a felony. So I don't think that that the issues that Representative O'Neill identified are unique to, to this bill or to cannabis. Also, though, I want to say that like my um, trustee uh, advocates that I've been working with corrected me. So they sent me some more specifics that I just wanted to share with you quickly, Representative O'Neill. So an ounce and a half of um, of flower cannabis that had a 20% THC level, which is like not super high, but kind of, you know, middle of the road, um, would have 8,500 milligrams of THC in it. Eight one gram cartridges at 97% purity would have 7,730 milligrams of THC. And so, you know, the, the advocates that I worked with did kind of try to use again, that like measure of the amount of, um, of THC to, to make it equivalent. The outlier in that case then is if you are in possession of something like a, a gummy that, as I said, right, has all that sugar and all that stuff in it, and that they'll still weigh, and it will still be that if there's eight grams of it, that you're above that petty misdemeanor level. So um, that's the first piece. The second thing that you discussed is um, is about intoxication, um, especially with concern uh, with respect to um, to driving. And this was an issue that we covered extensively 
in crafting House File 600. And so I'm not going to know all of the nuances, but I just wanted, because it was a long time ago that we did all that work, but I just wanted to say a few things about it. Um, so there's a pro se limit for alcohol, like 0 0.08. If you have that level of that substance in your body, you are in violation of the law if you're operating a motor vehicle. But for other intoxicating substances, there is no pro se level. There is no, um, no uh, you know, equivalent to a breathalyzer that can be administered in the field. But our law enforcement um, officers have to deal with intoxicated driving of all different kinds all the time. So, you know, if somebody's on a pharmaceutical, on Xanax, on Ambien, on an opiate, um, they rely on field tests for sobriety, on observing if the individual is intoxicated. So that's the standard is like, um, is there, it's, it's about the behavior, not the pro se limit, like with alcohol. But again, cannabis isn't unique in like, like in being a substance for which there is no pro se limit in law and there is no ability to administer a field test for that limit in the, in the person's body. Um, so I just wanted to say that also, I saw that uh, Mr. Gallagher took his camera off and he's like really smart on these issues. So if he has something to contribute or wants to correct any of the things I just said, that would be most welcome. I'll leave that to Mr. Gallagher. Well, I'm not sure on the protocol if I can just jump in or. Please. Okay. There is, I, I recall there is a bill in the legislature right now. I think it might have got out of committee for a pilot program for a roadside test for law enforcement to, I call it the spit test. I think they call it a liquid test from the driver, but basically you spit in something the cop tells you to spit into, and then they can tell if you have THC in your saliva. And, and a lot of jurisdiction use do use that these days. And I've, I've, I've personally have been promoting it. I don't know that any organization I'm affiliated with has endorsed it yet, but I think it's a kind of a neat solution because if a cop does, if a cop say smells marijuana or something in the car, the smell can be there for days. But if you hadn't used any that day, you wouldn't be under the influence. You spit into the spit test and it would clear you if you didn't use that day, the cop would know and say, okay, well, you can go home. As opposed to some cops who might be um, inclined to see something that might not actually be there. And the, the, the saliva does have Delta 9 THC in it, not metabolite. So it, it doesn't have the metabolite problem that say a urine test has. That is just a pilot program under the bill that's in the legislature right now, but I'm assuming they're going to come back in a couple of years and decide whether to, to go full, fully implement that. And there certainly have been efforts uh, over the years uh, from members, frankly, from both sides or all sides of the aisle um, on um, trying to find ways to get at this issue in terms of driving, um, um, you know, uh, field uh, experiences of knowing, you know, levels of intoxication, et cetera. I'm afraid we haven't quite uh, figured that out yet. Um, I do have uh, Rep Representative Johnson uh, and then Representative Hollins and Pinto and then uh, Representative Gomez. I think we're going to move to a, a, a vote. And, and then I do have a question just before then uh, for you, just a, a or procedural question. Uh, but Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, Representative Gomez. I, I, I do agree with you on some of this bill. I think we do need to split up the vegetable matter of cannabis and the concentrate. Uh, they are two separate type systems. But I'm surprised that uh, you, a little bit when you, uh, back when I was growing up, Havana Gold was the good stuff and that would be ditch wheat compared to the 20% uh, you talked about now. Um, and I do have some concerns. You actually, I wasn't going to vote for this bill, but you talked me out of it with your explanation of what this does. Uh, that's how concerned I am about some of the stuff in this bill. <clears throat> you talked about uh, how we've tried to change it, 
better and so it's not an issue um dealing dealing with the non-criminalizing it and all that has done is increase the use of marijuana by kids by decreasing the consequences uh, in uh, the, the best study ever done was uh, the Colorado study before they went to illegal recreational. It was just the medical. U use amongst teenagers dramatically increased once they went to medical marijuana. Also, uh, the uh, brain development of, of the human beings, the brain is developing until age 26. And we know THC actually affects brain development. So I have concerns there uh, with this, especially with, uh, as, as I can see, you're pushing towards full-blown recreational marijuana use and how that affects our kids and our young people up to the age of 26 uh, concerns me. I've seen what uh, synthetic marijuana does to an individual who's driving. Um, he was very, that, that, uh, uh, young adult was very fortunate. He didn't kill anybody when he crashed his vehicle, almost hitting the person working in their garden, had no clue where he was. And he only took two hits off of it. But, uh, you also mentioned about the pharmaceutical DWIs. I'm one of the, probably one of the few law enforcement officers in the state that's actually managed to get convictions on not one, but two. I, had, I believe I was the first one to ever get a conviction on a pharmaceutical DWI. It takes a lot of work. You, get, you can't just test for it. You actually have to know what the substance is that they have to test for. You have to do a lot of research and a lot of investigation before you start that test to know what the levels should be uh, per their prescription. Uh, so it's very difficult. Um, we don't know what the standards are for what, when you're impaired with marijuana. We know that in a DWI, driving under the influence of alcohol, at 0.8 is when the average person is impaired. We used to have 1.0, but the federal government changed it to 0.08 and actually held up our, traffic, our highway fund, federal highway funds until we changed to 0.08 or we'd lose them. You also talked about the uh, firearms issues. Yes, we can change the law that uh, in Minnesota, if you run uh, medical cannabis or use uh, small amounts of recreational, you still have the issue, it's a federal offense. The federal government could come in and charge you federally if you possess a firearm. That's concerning. Also, if we uh, cha change it to We'd actually have to have two separate uh, permit, to, permit uh, to carry licenses in order to carry in another state. Because I, I have a great concern that if we go to recreational without certain issues taken care of, dealing with the marijuana use and recreational marijuana use and the medical marijuana use, uh, our permits might, might not be valid in any other state because of the federal law. So we got to look at all the unintended consequences of some of these bills, but I'm more concerned about on this bill where it's going, reducing the uh, penalties and the great possibility that more youth are going to start using marijuana. I know there's some people that were testifying that think it's great that uh, more youth will use it, but uh, I'm concerned about what could happen to our youth um, and especially with the development of their brains as we know THC does affect the brain development. So with that, I cannot support this bill even though originally I was going to because I think it's a great idea that we, that we separate the cannabis or the vegetable matter from the concentrate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Johnson and uh, members. You know, three years ago, I had a, a really big bill that asked many of the same questions that Representative Johnson uh, asked and put it out in the form of a big uh, uh, citizens group to be able to spend time uh, answering those questions. I think these are all important questions for us to, 
um, to be uh, to be engaged in. Uh, I, 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 I even had the MPPOA supporting our bill, uh, not because they were supporting you know, legalization, but because they understood it was important uh, to dive deep into um, understanding um, uh, impacts, the what ifs, et cetera. Um, and you know, I, I, I do hope that you know, we get ourselves out of the darkness and, and have the courage to be able to raise the right type of questions uh, going forward. That's not to your bill, Representative Gomez, but just a commentary. All right, Representative Hollins and then uh, Representative Pinto, and then uh, we'll, we'll close this out. Representative Hollins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Gomez, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I am in support of this. Our laws absolutely need to be modernized, and we need to catch up with um, the way that this marijuana usage is going in Minnesota. But more than that, I really want to emphasize the fact that we are having this discussion about like these tiny amounts of THC when we are like poised and ready to legalize sports betting, um, which has a far more detrimental impact to a number of Minnesotans. And I really hope that everybody who's concerned about addiction issues in this committee will also be worried about addiction issues when we talk about um, legalizing gambling or making it easier for everybody to be gambling, especially children. So thank you very much, Representative Gomez. I appreciate your work on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Hollins. Representative Pinto. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to highlight something, and Representative Gomez can correct me if I'm misunderstanding this, but I think I'm getting it right, um, that we uh, currently uh, penalize possession of marijuana actually more harshly than other drugs in that, yes, there's the small amount that's set aside for petty misdemeanor, but after that, it's only a felony. And I think the, one of the most exciting parts of this bill, from my perspective, is to have a gross misdemeanor level, which would then match other drugs. So I just want to make folks understand um, that, that what this would do is simply have marijuana be treated in the same way as other drugs, that there's a level where it's a gross misdemeanor rather than a felony, which only seems fair. Um, and so um, thank you very much, Representative Gomez. And to my mind, to some of the other questioners, um, this adds to the nuance. Um, this is a, a more nuanced approach um, than the current approach that we're taking. Um, so thank you, Representative Gomez and, and Chair. Thank you, Chair Pinto. Uh, Representative uh, Gomez, close this out, then we'll, uh, oh, oh, and before you do, the motion is to go to transportation. I take it, uh, driver's license issues, is that the, um, I'm, I'm seeing a nodding uh, of the head, but I suspect that uh, if it moves uh, out of that committee, there's still a, another committee or two it needs to go to. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, yeah, thank you. So it does, there is, um, I, this there's a requirement about drug education and um, driver's license revocation um, for possession, and so that's why it has to go to transportation. It might have to go to judiciary and civil law. Um, that's I'm looking into that, um, but that's that part. Well, and Representative Galvez, uh, I'm being told that there might be oh hell. some fiscal adult issues as well that. Um, um, that still need to be uh, figured out, and perhaps uh, that that might also be part of the transportation stop. Um, but at any rate, we'll certainly uh, keep a close eye on this uh, if it moves. And uh, you know, uh, if there's any certainly if there's any impact, um, you know, on this committee's budget, you know, we'll uh, we'll we'll visit. Um, but Representative Gomez, uh, why don't you close this out, and then we'll go to a vote. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the, the opportunity. I did just feel a need to um, to respond to a couple of the uh, the things about youth use of cannabis. Um, first, I don't I, I would dispute that you heard anybody that you have ever heard anybody in the legislature, uh, whether a member or an advocate for for, you know, cannabis legalization for adults um, say that they wanted young people to use cannabis. Um, that's not true. Also, if you think that cannabis is not available to every young person, pretty much in the state of Minnesota, you're mistaken. Kids now have access to cannabis. We ask them in surveys. You could ask any young person that you know, who you have a frank relationship with. And if they trust you, they'll tell you, yes, they know how to get cannabis. Um, so, you know, the, the thing that we're trying to do actually 
with with our efforts at adult use, and I am a co-author of that. And so you said, yes, I do. I am somebody who believes that we need to um, to legalize cannabis. We need to expunge people's records. We need to repair the damage done, especially in communities of color, um, by the failed drug war. I am I am an advocate for House File 600 and other efforts at full legalization. Every one of those efforts, though, is focused on <clears throat> on bringing adults who use this substance, which is not dangerous to adults, out of the black market and into a regulated market where they actually know what they're buying. Because the vape disease from a few years ago, you might remember, that was impacting teenagers, that was because of adulterated cannabis cartridges that were being purchased on the black market. And the reason that those were available is because there's nowhere else for adults to purchase cannabis. And we have hundreds of thousands of adults in Minnesota who use cannabis for a number of different purposes. So, you know, I, I just would I just would dispute that um, that, you know, an effort to to regulate and legalize and expunge the records of those damaged by the war on drugs is an effort to like move more cannabis into the hands of children. It's absolutely untrue. The other thing is that the synthetic marijuana, right, that caused that terrible um, incident that you had to deal with, that is available in corner stores, on the internet, to any teenager. Those are the kind of substances that we want to move young people away from using. So I, I just I just needed to, to mention that. Um, but I, I really appreciate um, the chance to have this bill heard. I just wanted to mention, um, you know, it, this is a bipartisan effort. This is an effort that increasing amounts of our public, our constituents, Democrat, Republic, Republican, independent, and otherwise support, because it's just common sense. Um, we shouldn't be locking people up and throwing away the key for them using a substance that's less harmful than any number of substances that are regulated and available to adults um, and in stores across the state. Um, Senator Abler is the is the um, chief author of this bill in the Senate. Representatives Garofalo, West, and Munson have signed on in the House. There's plenty of room for more authors if any of my colleagues from the other side of the aisle want to sign on. Um, but you know, this is this is a, a common sense effort that Bring, has uh, obviously, if you look at your materials that were provided, that brings together people of really, um, you know, a variety of ideological approaches to the issue. And I appreciate the consideration by the committee. Thank you. Well, thank you, Representative Gomez, for bringing us a bill uh, that generated some good debate uh, with lots of perspectives here. Uh, that's the purpose of, of this committee. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Fraser renews his motion that House File 13. 55 as amended be referred to the Committee on Transportation. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Fraser. Aye. Vice Chair Fraser, aye. Lee Johnson. No. Lee Johnson, nay. Rep Edelson. Aye. Rep Edelson, aye. Rep Feist. Aye. Rep Feist, aye. Rep Grossel. No. Rep Grossel, nay. Rep Hollins. Aye. Rep Hollins, aye. Rep Hewitt. Aye. Rep Hewitt, aye. Rep Cleavorn? Aye. Rep Cleavorn, aye. Rep Long? Aye. Rep Long, aye. Rep Lucero? Look forward to future conversations, so I pass at this time. Rep Lucero, abstain? Yes. Rep Mueller? Mueller votes yes. Rep Mueller, aye. Rep Novotny? Rep Novotny, and always worried about addiction, no. Rep Novotny, nay. Rep O'Neill? O'Neill, no. <laughs> Rep O'Neill, nay. Rep Pinto? Aye. Rep Pinto, aye. Rep Poston? No. Rep Poston, nay. Rep Raleigh? Uh, Raleigh, nay. Rep Raleigh, nay. Rep Vang? Aye. Rep Vang, aye. Rep Shung? Shung, aye. Rep Shung, aye. With 12 ayes, 6 nays, and 1 abstain, that concludes roll call. Very well, with 12 ayes, six nays, and one abstention, uh, the motion does prevail and House File 1355 as amended is referred to the Committee on Transportation. Um, Representative Gomez, don't go anywhere. We have your, your bill up. Uh, your, uh, the next bill is also your bill, House File 883. Um, and I believe Representative uh, Fraser moves to refer 
Uh, actually, we're gonna we're gonna be laying this bill over. So uh, the chair is just pulling up this bill, um, and um, we'll be laying it over for possible inclusion um, in a, in an omnibus bill. So, uh, Mr. Gomez, eight eight three is before us, um, and I believe you have an A one amendment. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, it's it's a it's a DE. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. You have, and so, let me check with. Uh, let me check with our uh, our legal staff to make sure I'm, I'm re referring the correct um, you know uh, reference number to the amendment. I don't say it's an A one amendment, but I just want to make sure for the record we're voting on what's yeah. before. Yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Jeff Diebel. Mr. Diebel. Yeah. Um, you bear with me for a minute. Let me pull up the. Uh, All right. Don't be like ambushing our staff. I know I'm being a bit of a stickler here, but I think particularly in virtual space, I think it's really important that the record shows we're referring to the right um, you know, numbering system of, of any amendments before us. Uh, my staff is indicating that it is um, uh, entitled a DE1 amendment. And Mr. Chair, it is posted on the website, the DE. All right, very well. Representative uh, Gomez, you're comfortable then? Um, so, Representative um, uh, Representative Fraser, would you do us a favor of moving the DE one amendment to House File eight eight three? So move, Mr. Chair. Very well. Motions before us, Representative Gomez. DE one amendment tells me it's putting it into shape that you wish it to be before us. Am I correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Very well, Representative Johnson. Voice vote suffice here. Got to be fine. Very well. Thank you, sir. All in favor of. Uh, adopting uh, the, or amending House File 883 with the E1 okay. amendment, please say aye. 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 Same sign. Motion prevails. House File 883 is amended. Uh, as amended is before us. Uh, Representative Gomez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I misspoke. This doesn't really have anything to do with cannabis. This is about, but this is about um, drug paraphernalia law. So um, this uh, bill amends the definition of drug paraphernalia and um, removes uh, equipment or products that are used for testing the strength, effectiveness, or purity of a controlled substance. Um, the reason for the DE1 or the DE amendment is that um, actually last year in 2021, we um, adopted a change to this statute which excludes. Uh, material used for testing for fentanyl from the definition of paraphernalia. Uh, I mean, the reason for this is because, as as we know, um, you know, there are people who use drugs in our communities and in our lives, and um, sometimes they are taking adulterated substances that can be deadly to them. Um, you know, in the case of fentanyl. Um, I think we're all aware of the opioid crisis and the sort of progression and the way that the introduction of fentanyl into the, the opioid supply in our country has meant that a lot more people are dying. Um, this expands that to, because right now, um, it, it, one of the items that's just included in drug paraphernalia is, you know, these, these testing materials. And so it just exempts them all together and doesn't make it so that it's only for fentanyl. And the reason for this is because there are other types of adulterants that commonly show up in um, controlled substances that are dangerous to human health and are of concern. And these include um, bath salts and uh, research chemicals of various kinds. And so uh, this is really a, a pretty simple change. Um, I think that it aligns with, you know, the, the um, excluding fentanyl testing strips from the definition of paraphernalia, which was a bipartisan effort last year in the House and the Senate. Um, and so that's the bill. It's a little, just strikes a couple lines and I have a, a testifier or two maybe. 
Very well. I see uh, Marin or Marin uh, Schroeder, if you could come forward, uh, state your name for the record and give us your testimony. Yes. Hi, I'm Marin Schroeder. I'm the policy director for Sensible Change Minnesota. Um, I want to thank you uh, for letting me testify today. Sensible Change Minnesota is a nonprofit advocacy organization with a mission to create safer communities through sensible policy changes that mitigate the consequences of the war on drugs. Um, I'm here to testify in support of House File 883, amending the definition of drug paraphernalia to remove items that test for the strength or purity of a controlled substance. Minnesota's drug paraphernalia laws were written and passed in 1980, over 40 years ago. Certainly much has changed in the last 40 years, and in more recent years, Minnesota has worked diligently to reduce the harms of drug use, including establishing a robust naloxone distribution program that continues to save lives. Last year, the legislature passed an exception to the drug paraphernalia definition that permitted the possession of items that test for fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, something our colleagues at the Rumler Hope Network have seen positive results from. However, we can and we should go further in our efforts to detect and prevent the consumption, consumption of adulterants like bath salts in illicit drugs. By changing the definition of drug paraphernalia, we will permit service providers, family, friends, and drug users themselves the ability to test suspected drugs to ensure users know what they are ingesting so they can modify their use based on that knowledge. Several studies from Europe and Australia have shown that adulterant screening positively impacts behavioral outcomes, especially when used in partnership with a health or social service organization. Adulterant screening is a public health service unavailable in Minnesota solely because of this definition. It is really hard for our team to understand what the opposition to this change could be, and we hope to see this legislation cross the finish line this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. I appreciate your testimony uh, and your work. Um, I don't see any others, and so uh, Representative Gomez will open this up uh, for um, our uh, committee members for a question and our comments. And I'm not seeing that. So uh, uh, Representative Gomez, why don't you uh, close this out, and then we'll move to lay this over. I would thank you for the robust conversation, Mr. Chair, but no, um, I really appreciate it, uh, committee members. This is really a, it's just a simple change um, that will help to save, um, potentially save lives or potentially save someone from, from permanent damage from ingesting a chemical that they just never intended to. And so um, I appreciate the consideration of, of this effort. It's really just about, you know, reducing harm to people in our community. So thank you very much. Very well. Um, thank you, Representative Hollins. Uh, the chair then uh, will lay over House File 883 as amended um, for uh, possible inclusion. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Thanks for spending some time with us uh, this evening. Always good to see you. Uh, Representative Feist, you're up next. Uh, human trafficking statutes uh, clarify. Uh, Representative Feist, um, we're, it looks like we're going to be laying this over as well. So the chair will move up, but we'll call forth uh, House, file, House File 4078. Representative Feist, your bill is before us. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill was developed in collaboration between the Hennepin County Attorney's Office and the Advocates for Human Rights and labor trafficking experts. The goal with these changes is to address some glaring holes in our existing statutes that enable perpetrators to evade the law. This bill also enhances penalties in labor trafficking scenarios where the victim is under the age of 18, the trafficking occurs for an extended period of time, or the victim suffers great bodily harm or death. My testifier, Susan Crum, Senior Assistant Hennepin County Attorney in the Complex Crimes Unit, will provide more technical detail and can explain the specific scenarios that this amendment to the law is designed to address. Thank you. Very well. Thank you, Representative Feist. Uh, Ms. Crum, please come forward. State your name for the record and give us your testimony. Yes. Good evening, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. 
My name is Susan Crum, and I'm a senior assistant county attorney with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. As Representative Feist stated, uh, the goal of the amendments to this statute are to simplify and clarify the definitions in the labor trafficking statute, as well as amending the sentencing provisions to reflect the risk of physical injury or harm inherent in the context of trafficking. In 2008, uh, we prosecuted an individual for labor labor trafficking, theft by swindle, and insurance fraud. Uh, the defendant was a labor broker and a subcontractor on a number of large residential construction projects. Uh, the the uh, defendant uh, was employing a number of workers specifically in drywall and framing in those projects. Labor brokers use a business model of misclassifying employees as independent contractors to avoid the expense of workers' compensation insurance, which means they're able to underbid law-abiding contractors, which hurts the whole construction industry. But not only do they uh, do that, but they also exploit undocumented workers or manipulate their visa status to coerce labor. Those workers also have no workers' compensation insurance coverage. They have no health care. When they're injured, they're not permitted to seek out medical care because if they're asked how their uh, injury occurred, they would be they would then have to say that it was work related. Traffickers also often use real or false claims of debts to coerce workers to work. The defendant in our case uh, told our trafficking victim that he would help him be released from ICE custody. He told him that he would retain an attorney for him and pro provide bail to get him out. Uh, he did provide his bail, however, he did not hire an attorney for him. And once the victim was out of custody, he told him, now you need to work for me. There was never a bond or a contract. There was never anything formal memorializing the debt um, or that the victim had a way to repay it. And that is the reality of the debt bondage that is referred to within the statute. There isn't a contract there isn't an agreement, and there's no record of the debt or the victim's ability to discharge that debt. And when you look at the language of the debt bondage uh, definition, it's couched in terms of contract language with debtor and pledge and uh, is, is not the reality of what we see within trafficking. That's often a situation, too, that we see with individuals who are brought to the United States to work as a nanny um, or in other types of service work. The trafficker tells them, I'm going to buy your plane ticket, I'll pay for other expenses, and now you need to work for me, and there's no formal agreement and no way to pay off the debt. The facts of our case, uh, again, caused us to look at the language of the statute for guidance on uh, what was in, was what was the intent um, when the statute was passed, and did the conduct that we observed uh, fall within the prohibitions of that statute? Um, a couple of months after our victim was told that he now was in debt to his trafficker, he was badly injured on a job site when a wall fell on him and fractured his back in several places. Um, prior to this, our, uh, the, our trafficker had told all of the workers, I'm a volunteer for ICE. I have, you know, I know important people in high places. I can help you out um, and clearly implied to them that he had uh, some sort of special relationship with the federal government uh, that would give him the power to help them or also harm them. When the victim in this case was injured, uh, his fellow workers were very concerned about his condition, despite the defendant's uh, protestations that they couldn't take him to the hospital. They did take him to HCMC. The defendant then came to the hospital and told the victim, you cannot tell them that you were injured on um, at a job site. They won't care how badly injured you are. You will be deported. And because of that, he had to tell them that it didn't happen on a job site and in fact applied for charity care at the direction of the defendant. 
um, and then his medical care was paid for by public money. Uh, clearly, the implication of these statements was the invocation of some sort of legal process. It was not clear to us from looking at the wording um, of the statute that that legal process or abuse of that legal process was what was prohibited by the statute. So we have two suggestions there for language changes regarding debt bondage and abuse of the legal process. There are also further suggested amendments to address challenges to the language and the definitions uh, contained uh, for forced labor or services that recognize that there are threats that are used for force or coercion, and then there's also actual harm. And the reality is for most traffickers, the threats are what works and they don't have to result to those harms. Regarding the proposed changes to the sentencing portion of the statute, the present statute only differentiates between victims who are under 18 and victims who are over 18. Now, addition in, in addition to traffickers uh, not having workers' compensation insurance, they often violate OSHA regulations. Their workers don't have appropriate safety equipment. Uh, as we saw for the victim um, in our labor traffic trafficking case, they're not allowed to receive medical care because the workers' compensation premium evasion will be revealed as a result of that. So these trafficking victims are at greater risk for injury or death. Our proposed amendment here uh, is uh, a proposal that suggests three different levels of seriousness uh, for the harm that uh, potentially is there for victims. The most serious obviously is trafficking, um, where the trafficking results in death. The second most serious is where victim, uh, victim is under 18. They could suffer great bodily harm or have been a victim of trafficking or an extended period of time. And then the least serious level of trafficking would be all other uh, offenses. Thank you for your consideration, Chief Marian or Chair Mariani and the committee, and I'm available for questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Crum. I have to say, as I'm listening to the testimony, I'm just, I continue to just, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, the issue of, um, of dead bondage um, is as old as our nation. And uh, we certainly saw all sorts of uh, forms of that, uh, even after um, after the um, uh, the elimination of, of slavery in our, in, in our nation. And so it's just a scourge that um, uh, we have to constantly be vigilant. I, I uh, my, my uh, community where I live in, um, there were, um, individuals uh, who uh, were related to individuals who were victimized by the person uh, that your office uh, brought to justice. So thank you uh, for that work. Um, we also have uh, Madeline Lohman uh, from Advocates for uh, Human Rights. If you can come forward, uh, Ms. Lohman, and give us her name uh, for the record and give us your testimony, we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you are here. Sorry, I didn't see you earlier, so I thought you weren't here. I'm sorry, I'll let you testify. <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, Chair Mariani and, and Representative Feist and members of the committee. My name is Madeline Lohman. I'm a senior researcher with the Advocates for Human Rights, and we are very pleased to testify in support of the bill today. Um, we've done extensive work on labor trafficking in Minnesota. For people who aren't familiar with the, the entirety of what labor trafficking is, I think Susan really illustrated a particular case, but uh, the, the heart of it is when an individual uses control or manipulation or coercion to get some kind of labor or services from the victim, and the victim believes they're unable to leave or stop. So they're essentially trapped in this situation because of the actions of the trafficker. And the goal of this bill is to really bring clarity to what those actions are. Um, to ensure that we're really protecting the most vulnerable. This is something that happens throughout the state of Minnesota. We uh, have interviewed people and we serve clients um, from all over. We've had cases of uh, agricultural workers on temporary visas where the trafficker threatened to withhold their visa and forced them to pay kickbacks. We've had um, people whose intimate partners uh, engaged in serious domestic violence to force them to work and turn over all of their earnings. 
Um, we've had U.S. citizen youth who join magazine sales crews to go door to door and end up trapped in situations um, where we, we heard one story of a young lady who had to crawl out of a hotel window in Chicago because the company had a representative in the hotel rooms with all of their workers to make sure that none of them could leave. Um, so, so this is something that really impacts all of us. Uh, there could be victims in, in any community. Um, and I think as Susan pointed out, it also impacts us because it imposes costs on our communities as a whole. We have seen, um, in the biannual human trafficking report that the uh, Department of Public Safety put out in 2017, service providers identified 394 victims of labor trafficking. So that's fairly significant, but we believe it's a significant undercount because there's almost no routine screening for labor trafficking by government agencies or service providers. So it's quite unusual for people to identify labor trafficking victims. So the fact that we're seeing 400 without any real screening, I think speaks to the magnitude of the pro problem. However, despite the fact that service providers are seeing nearly 400 victims, since we passed the current labor trafficking law in 2005, there have only been three labor trafficking cases charged under the statute and only one that secured a conviction, which is the case that um, Susan Crumb was talking about. So we really need to make the statute something that people can use to protect the vulnerable in our communities. I think uh, Susan really highlighted some of the confusing language around debtor and abuse of a legal process. But I also want to highlight that this is not just bringing clarity to our law. This is also bringing us into conformity with other states. We were one of the first states to pass human trafficking legislation, and so we did not have many models to draw on. Now we can look at other states that have passed their statutes more recently and see that they may have expanded definitions that help protect a greater range of victims. So one of the things that we have uh, made explicit in the law is that Trafficking victims may be threatened with or actually experience bodily, psychological, economic, or reputational harm. This is a provision that's used in 26 other states with similar examples of harm, and those states include ones such as Alabama, Montana, Oklahoma, and New York. We also have introduced the levels of seriousness for sentencing that reflect the harm experienced by the victim. And there are a number of other states, including Hawaii, Kentucky, Missouri, and Tennessee, that also have enhanced penalties when victims suffer serious harm. So this is something bringing us into step with how states are approaching labor trafficking, as well as bringing really needed clarity to the law. The Advocates for Human Rights also um, just wants to point out and, and urge members of the community to take seriously uh, increased enforcement and prosecution of crimes can fall unequally on people of color and immigrants. So that's that's a, a big concern of ours to um, increase criminalization of a behavior. But on the other hand, labor trafficking, uh, the populations that are most vulnerable to it are immigrants, people of color, um, people living in poverty, youth, people with criminal records really highly vulnerable populations that need our protection. So we support protecting those most vulnerable to exploitation and trafficking by passing this bill and improving our labor trafficking statute. But I really wanna urge robust monitoring and oversight of these changes to make sure the law does not inadvertently increase racial disparities in criminal justice. So thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Um, and I look forward to working with you on the bill. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sloman. I appreciate your testimony and the work that you all do over at Advocates for Human Rights. Um, Representative Feist, that's all I have um, for, uh, listed for uh, testifiers. It'd be appropriate to open this up for discussion and comments from uh, and debate from um, your colleagues here. Uh, Chair Pinto. Yeah, and I guess I just want to note for folks, we've, we've spent so much, we spent so much attention and energy in our state through the years on on sex trafficking um, and i've spent a lot of time on that issue and so much less on labor trafficking i just really appreciate um ms Loman and her work and the advocates and representative price for for carrying this um, forward because um, we really need to write that imbalance 
Um, and it's all human trafficking, um, but it's just, it has not had this captured the public attention in the same way. And it's just really critical. So many thanks to you all. Indeed. Thank you, uh, Chair Pinto. Representative Raleigh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Two things real quick. Um, to the author, what's the reason for removing blackmail? I'm just looking for some background on that, um, because I, I would I would think that that would be a useful definition. So I'm curious uh, um, how that's uh, how that's being constructed. Thank you. Representative Fies. Yes, thank you, Representative Brawley. Good question. It's not actually being eliminated, and I'll let Susan Crum provide the technical explanation, but my understanding is that that was just deleted up top because it was integrated later on, and Susan can point to the specific section where that is brought back in. Very well, Ms. Crum. Yes, thank you, Chair Mariani and Representative Feist and Representative Raleigh. That's that's correct. We uh, we took out what we thought was sort of an archaic uh, term, blackmail, uh, and changed that to reputational harm, and that's integrated in one of the other portions um, of the definition of forced labor services. So it's reputational harm instead of blackmail. Oh. I didn't know that. I'm very I good. Either. Thank you, uh, Representative Raleigh. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, that uh, now I'm going to read it slightly different because what I was worrying about yeah, yeah. was, you know, with the with the prevalence of you know, electronic tools, email, uh, social media, um, cyber bullying, and things like that, and just I want to make sure we're strengthened on that side of it. Um, and then uh, uh, to the author, uh, Representative Feist. So I'm, I'm looking for the impetus to this bill. Do we know how many cases um, are, are that this bill would be addressing? Uh, historically, how many have we had? And then kind of what does the future look like once we can apply this part of the, uh, of the law? Mr. Chair, thank you. And Representative Feist, I think Ms. Lohman was uh, sharing some demographics, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll turn to you first. Yeah, thank you, Representative Raleigh. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of times prosecutors don't charge these uh, crimes because they aren't covered under the existing protections around labor trafficking. And so I don't know, um, and, and Ms. Crum and Ms. Loman can, can chime in what type of data there is, but my understanding is that a lot of times, unlike the sort of high profile case that led to this bill, um, these charges aren't even brought because they don't fall within the existing framework. And Ms. Crum might have something to add. Thank or you, Ms. Representative Vice. And, and I, I believe Ms. Lohman probably will also have helpful information in that regard. One of the things that we discovered in our prosecution is that the labor trafficking statutes have not been ranked under the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines, which is a huge barrier to uh, practitioners in criminal law and determining what the parameters are or likely outcomes. Uh, and uh, part of our parsing out of likely sentences in this case was looking at our unranked offense we had no other cases to compare it to and what a likely sentence would be uh, and realized that our, our case, our victim was very badly injured, but he survived his injuries. We could have cases that that is not the outcome. So um, we, we are strongly urging the legislature to request that the Guidelines Commission rank these offenses. Ms. Thank you. Loman. Thank you, Ms. Kramis Loman. Um, yes, thank you, Chair Mariani, and uh, thank you for the question, Representative Raleigh. This is uh, an area where there's very, very poor data because people um, are not actively identifying labor trafficking in the same way. Um, I think Representative Pindo pointed out we have quite a extensive investment in sex trafficking. We have a network of service providers whose job it is to work with youth and determine whether they've experienced sex traffic. We have nothing comparable for labor trafficking. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of luck of the draw whether a labor trafficking victim encounters someone who can recognize what's happening to them. Um, but even given that we've seen, um, you know, in 2017, that's the last year for which I have data, the Department of Public Safety found that service providers saw 394 victims and labor uh, law enforcement investigated 21 cases, um, but they did not bring charges in all, uh, you know, almost all of those cases. Um, it's not 
clear that all of those cases would be chargeable, even under the statute, because obviously law enforcement mm -hmm. ends up investigating cases that don't um, have all the elements. But my guess is that we would see, uh, you know, a, a increase in the number of cases investigated here because we now have a lot more clarity in the law. I think it's going to be easier for prosecutors to understand, easier for law enforcement to understand. And I do think it expands um, a little bit of the harms that victims experience and will bring more people into the protections of the law. So I don't know that we can give hard numbers. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to see hundreds of cases, but I do think we will see um, an increase. Professor Raleigh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this last question is more of a construction question. Um, uh, to the author, if we could go to page two, starting at uh, 2.18. Now, I'll wait for a moment uh, until I get a head nod that you're there. No. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Chair, the, the question that I've got, and, and again, this is more of a construction question, and then it's, it's two parts. Um, this deals with what's called the debt bondage. Debt bondage means, and I'm reading it as it's written, not the way that it's crossed out and everything else. Debt bondage means a status or condition of a person who provides labor or services of any kind to pay a real or alleged debt. And I'll, I'll stop there. And so my, my two questions on that are, when you say real debt, is that the construction of like real property? Or what's the definition? And I, I, it's not that I'm trying to slice hairs here, but I'm looking for the definition of the word real. Yes, thank you. Representative Raleigh, you pointed to a good section because there are actually some technical phrasing uh, amendments that we would be making if this bill is incorporated into an omnibus bill that cleans that up a bit. But but specific to your question, when we talk about real or um, alleged debt, what we're trying to get at is the fact that sometimes people are told that they owe a debt mm -hmm. to their trafficker, but they don't actually owe a debt. So it's not like real property. It's just saying that they may have a debt, they may not, but the holding of a debt over their head is the wow. is what we're trying to cover under this law. Representative Father. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I just wanted to make sure that we're not creating some like, you know, construct for real property or something like that. That that was it. I'm satisfied, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Valley. Rep Representative Leo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just really quickly. Um, so if you're changing blackmail to reputational harm, do you have a definition somewhere of what that means? And the reason I ask that is, you know, we just added a large section to the CSC statutes about extortion. And we go into great detail as to what constitutes extortion. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have some sort of definition if you're going to change the words. Sounds like a question for Ms. Crum, Representative Feist. Um, yes, Mr. Chair. I'm looking just at, I'm cross referencing the two versions of the bill that I have in front of me, and I don't see that either of them provides a specific definition uh, for reputational harm. And so I'm not sure if that's defined elsewhere. And so I will turn it over to my experts. Very well, thank you for confirming that, uh, Ms. Crum. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Mariani and Representative Feist and Representative O'Neill. Um, we did have some conversation about uh, including sexual ex that new sexual exploitation language in this bill uh, and thought that adding all of those elements of having to prove that in addition to all of the elements of labor trafficking would be unhelpful. Um, we felt that reputational harm would be general enough to capture what could be, um, well, the types of harm that Representative Raleigh had referenced. It could be something over the internet, it could be text messages, um, social media, um, and uh, but th that's a good question and we certainly could consider whether we need to uh, include a specific definition. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I would assume that if we don't define it, the courts will because they're gonna need to, I mean, yes, the plain language of what those words mean might work too, but um, I just know with doing this for a decade that it might be something you want to define at some point if we don't have it. I'm guessing if that's new terminology, it's not defined in statute. That's what I'm saying. I'm sure blackmail is. Very well, thank you. Um, um, I think perhaps some good advice uh, worth uh, a little bit more vetting. Uh, Representative Grassle, and then we'll uh, We'll move uh, to close this out, Representative Feist. Representative Grassley. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Weiss, uh, for bringing this forward. Uh, you know, I, I heard uh, Representative Pinto talking about the the uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking, such that's that this 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 trafficking of of of, of our people, our children, of uh, those who are missing. I mean, this is a multi-headed serpent. It is a multi-headed serpent that needs to be attacked from all directions, from all levels. And I want to uh, I want to thank you for bringing this forward. And then also I want to throw in there the idea of child pornography. These children are also victims and victims all uh, continuously. And that is something that else that we have to bring into the light to attack that is uh, vehement, vehemently as we are attacking human trafficking, labor, labor trafficking, sex trafficking. And you know, so I, I thank you for, for getting into the fight and I look forward to uh, getting some help with uh, fighting the battle against child pornography as well. Thank you. Very well. Uh, Representative Feist, uh, why don't you close us out here? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I just feel very strongly that this bill is an important protection for, for victims in Minnesota who currently aren't protected under the existing law. And as our experts explained, they're really uniquely vulnerable victims. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm very honored to be introducing this bill that will, will create greater protections here in Minnesota for these victims. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Price. I want to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Lohman and Ms. Crum uh, as well uh, for bringing us uh, this concept and this, uh, this work. Um, I've been uh, uh, tracking uh, a little bit uh, what y'all have been doing, and um, um, you know, kudos to you, um, uh, all, all, all of you and others, uh, to strengthen uh, this area of law. But with that, uh, members, uh, the chair lays over. Uh, we did not amend. No. Did we? Not yet, Mr. No, Chair. No, no, no. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, um, there, there will be amendments no doubt coming. Uh, the Chair lay, uh, lays over House File 4078 for possible inclusion. Thank you again uh, to all the testifiers and to you, uh, Representative Feist. Uh, Chair Pinto, um, uh, House File 3785, the Chair uh, brings forth uh, that bill uh, for possible, uh, for laying over possible inclusion as well. Representative Pinto, your bill is before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Mr. Chair, I do have an author's amendment. Let's see, it's coded. Um, looking for the amendment number, you may have that, Mr. I Chair. See, I see A1. It is an A1. That's uh, that's. I think that's correct. And, and Mr. Chair, that uh, the the bill um, contains uh, has uh, funds that flow through uh, the post board as it's drafted, and the post board had contacted uh, me and said, you know, those funds would be better to flow through OJP Office of Justice Programs, and so that's what the A one amendment does. And I'd ask that that, uh, that we pass that first to just get the bill in the correct form. Simple enough uh, change. Uh, Representative Pinto moves adoption of the A one uh, amendment. Representative Johnson, uh, we can voice vote this one. That would be fine. Very well. Thank you. Um, and so um, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Uh, and the A1, or, or House File 3785 is amended with the A1 amendment. Representative Pinto to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So members, uh, the idea for this bill came uh, through a, a conversation with a constituent uh, and the uh, the desire to have uh, more women in policing uh, and more people in policing uh, in general, um, where there is um, uh, not necessarily the same um, emphasis on, uh, on upper body strength and some aspects of uh, physical fitness tests that are, um, that are administered by agencies um, currently. Um, in uh, talking with a constituent, knowing that there's a strong movement um, among um, Many officers to say that we really need to have more women in policing. Uh, this was a barrier that was identified. Um, that there are agencies that have uh, physical fitness tests that are not necessarily tied to the needs of the job, um, but um, maybe contain um, outdated elements. Uh, you know, a certain number of pull-ups or push-ups uh, that uh, that aren't necessarily tied to what's actually going on with the job. Um, at the same time, I found out that uh, the League of Minnesota Cities had, in fact, developed a uh, strength and agility test. Um, that has been scientifically validated and it is in use at a number of agencies uh, around the state. Um, and so uh, uh, an idea uh, came together then to say, you know, 
if agencies are requiring a fitness test, so that's uh, their decision to do so. If they do, we want to make sure that those tests are scientific, scientifically validated, uh, that they actually are meet the, the requirements of the job, uh, and there should be support for agencies in doing so. And so what the bill does is provide uh, both the requirement uh, uh, in Section 1 regarding these tests, but then also funding in Section 2 to support uh, local uh, law enforcement agencies uh, that, that uh, wish to use um, these tests. Uh, the amendment we, we passed just to send the funds now through OJP rather than through the post uh, post board. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, I, I believe that I have a testifier from the League of Minnesota Cities, though I'm not quite sure that she's on. I'm a little bit worried that there may have been a miscommunication there. I thought Laura Kushner was on with us. Um, we can maybe check if there is someone, and if not, I, I do know that Captain Wagner from uh, Mendota Heights is on in any case. All right, let's check to see if uh, Laura Kushner or anyone from the League of Minnesota Cities is here. Is here. I'm not seeing that. Yeah, may have been, may, may not have been able to, Mr. Chair. And so if we can move to the move to the uh, to the testifier, um, and I guess just as we do, Mr. Chair, I'll note that there is a letter of support from the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association, uh, and um, I've had uh, positive conversations with some other groups as well, and I know the league is is supportive as well. Terrific. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, Captain Lane uh, Wegner uh, from Mendota Heights. Uh, welcome, uh, Captain, to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and give us your testimony. Thank you, Chair Mariani. My name is Wayne Wegener, and I am the captain of the Mendota Heights Police Department. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, <clears throat> excuse me, for the time to speak this evening in support of House File 3785. Like other careers in both public and private sectors, law enforcement strives to get the most qualified individuals into their profession. However, unlike many professions, law enforcement has a very important physical element to it. Through scientifically validated testing for law enforcement candidates, we help ensure those choosing a career in the law enforcement industry are physically fit to do so. Furthermore, by having validated testing, we also help to ensure we are assessing officer candidates fairly and impartially no matter that candidate's age, gender, stature, et cetera, and to the standards that are job specific. Scientifically validated testing is also defendable. This is another reason it's important we afford every agency across the state to have access to this testing. Law enforcement agencies, no matter their size, must have the opportunity to bring in new officers with a standard that is defendable. Along with access, it is also important there's a funding mechanism to participate within the testing. Many law enforcement budgets, especially those in outstate Minnesota, may not be able to allocate the funds needed for this testing. We have an opportunity here to create funding source that will support every law enforcement agency across the state. The upfront cost to implement scientifically validated testing is nominal compared to the potential cost an agency may encounter if they are not implemented. The adoption of scientifically content validated and job related physical strengths and agility examinations is just one more way law enforcement, the law enforcement profession in Minnesota can meet the expectations of police departments that they work for and the citizens that they serve. Again, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Captain uh, Wagner. Uh, with that, I don't see any other testifiers, uh, Chair Pinto, and so I'll turn to uh, committee members. Uh, we have Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Pinto, for this. So this brings back some uh, um, memories. <laughs> when I went through the State Patrol, uh, when I applied, I came upon the day of the uh, physical agility, and I was able to get through everything, the running, the jumping, everything, push-ups, but I couldn't get through the sit-ups. My fat gut got in the way. So the physical agility, though, uh, uh, I am wondering, can you, do you have some examples of wh what types of physical agility are being administered, but you don't believe are, are relevant to it? I'm not sure if you're, you faded out, but uh, perhaps a question. Oh, I'm for sorry, my, my question, are, are, do you have some examples of where physical agility is being administered, but in your opinion is not uh, applicable or shouldn't be applicable? Very well, thank you, Representative Lucero. Might be a good question for the captain. Um, 
Mm. Indeed, 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 Mr. Chair. Yeah, if, if he can, I was hoping that Ms. Kushner would be uh, might be on, but I think the captain should hopefully be able to help with that. No, I'll cut the word. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Lucero, uh, to your point, yes, uh, sit-ups and push-ups, I've uh, never done them in my career while <laughs> on a call. So some of the components that, um, that we would look at or that have been considered scientifically validated, if I could speak uh, a little bit out of turn, I did sit on a committee that um, guided and gave input into the League of Minnesota Cities um, component of it. I'm not going to, I won't speak directly to that, but some of the pieces that we did look at for validation were carrying a particular number of pounds up flights of stairs that would simulate carrying a medical bag or um, a rifle, for example. Uh, there was a component of a, a mannequin or a dummy drag X amount of feet that would, you know, simulate having to carry or pull somebody to safety. So things of that nature that are job specific, I think, is is what you're looking for. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just one more follow-up. And it can be for the chair or or the captain. Uh, what is the definite, and probably actually, I'm sorry, not the chair, uh, the bill author. Probably This question is probably for the bill author. What is the definition of scientifically, as the bill language reads, scientifically content validated? How does one ensure that that is, is met? versus not met. Sure, Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Lucero. Great, great question. Um, uh, the, so the answer is in that next sentence in the bill, um, that it really is gonna be up to the post board to develop um, the rules that will establish standards to determine that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, uh, we know, we have this one example from League of Minnesota Cities um, and kind of, you know, what are the methods that they've used um, to identify that? Um, uh, you know, we want to leave that in the hands of, of the expertise of the post board um, would be my thinking. And I'm obviously not an expert myself. What we want to do though is not have it be something that is, you know, well, we've, we've always done it that way. It's always been, uh, you know, pull-ups or sit-ups or whatever, but then in fact, there is a, a certain rigor in putting it together. Um, but we'll, we'll leave that to the post board to, to establish those rules as the bill says. All right. Thank so, you. And one, just one quick follow-up on this. Yes, sir. Representative Lucero, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, that that I take issue with because the language before us is we have to vote on this language as we, we see it printed. And so could it not just been easily done to have written a language that says uh, agencies for applicants must be job-related, period. So what is the intent? And, and, and I don't necessarily have to answer now, but we have to make a decision on what's scientifically validated. Now the post board may come up with that list, but what is is the bill author's intent of the word scientifically? Because that was deliberately entered in there, uh, and it sounds like it's it's so and am, am, has ambiguity that it, we could just strike that from the language. Obviously, not. I'm not suggesting we do that now, but I don't see uh, a reason for it. Then, if it could just be just. Sure, Pinto. Uh yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I guess, Representative Sarah, I guess I, I mean, I disagree, I suppose, that, you know, we um, we have a structure where we establish, uh, we sort of set uh, uh, guidelines, goals, you know, do things with certain, with agencies, and then uh, charge them with developing rules to to, to fill in those details. Um, to my mind, that word scientifically plays a really important role that we say, look, it's not, not a stab in the dark. Um, there should be um, you know, a, a scientific method that lies behind it um, so that, you know, and there's all those elements, the scientific method that, you know, you're testing, you're validating, um, you know, et cetera. So I, I think that that word um, does play an important role, um, but it also recognized that we are not the experts in those details, but we're directing the post board to use their expertise in a particular way. Very well. Um, next we have uh, Chair Long. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to thank uh, Representative Pinto for bringing this bill. Um, I recall uh, our former uh, Minneapolis Police Chief, Janae Harto, was a huge proponent of uh, modifying uh, some of these standards in, in the Minneapolis Police Department. And that was because she recalled, you know, when she was um, a younger a police officer that uh, oftentimes the uh, trainings, uh, the uh, uh, standards for physical fitness were uh, designed specifically to keep 
uh, women off of the force. Um, and, you know, things like push-ups, I think, as the example was given, are not something you often stop in the middle of a, of a crime to, to do. So uh, I think this makes a lot of sense. And I just also wanted to note that there's been a lot of good evidence and a lot of research over many, many years about the importance of having women uh, on police forces. Uh, both uh, some of the studies I recall, it uh, reduces uh, even having a woman uh, police officer as a partner uh, is re reducing the risk that uh, officers will um, have excessive use of force. Uh, women police officers compared to their male counterparts have uh, fewer sustained uh, complaints against them for excessive force. Um, and they also uh, cost departments less money in settlements overall. So there's uh, certainly a lot of reasons, I think, to have uh, women police officers and to have, I think, standards that are tailored to the real needs of the job. So I just want to thank Representative Pinto for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, Chair Long. And then finally, we have uh, Representative Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Pinto. Uh, you know, I, I've heard a couple of things said about uh, push-ups and sit-ups and so on and so forth. Uh, if you are going to uh, apply push-ups, uh, if you have to help somebody to get a vehicle to the side of the road, you are going to be using that muscle group to uh, employ and to move that vehicle off the side of the road to safety in, in case of a breakdown, so, something like that. Um, overall core body strength is very important, uh, especially in the area, in the rural areas where I was patrolling. I was the only deputy on at night over a whole county uh, in rural Minnesota. And so, it, you know, uh, the overall physical training, the overall uh, making sure that you were uh, fit for those duties because you did not know what you were going to run into. You never know what is going to be in the next traffic stop. You never know what is going to happen at the next call. It is, it's, it is a, an unpredictable environment. And uh, Representative Pinto, I'm sure you have seen cases where something went from zero to 100 miles an hour uh, in the snap of a finger. So uh, with that being said, with these standards, um, are they going to be uh, standards that are universal? Uh, apply uh, apply uh, the same standards to both men and women. Uh, Chair Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Russell, um, yes, that's my understanding is the, I mean, yes, uh, that was my expectation. Uh, the bill makes no distinction based on gender. And I don't believe the League of Minnesota Cities um, uh, test that is currently being used makes any distinction based on gender. It may be that Captain Wegener can just confirm that for us. Um, Mr. Chair, with your, with your permission. Of course, Captain Wagner, are you still with us? Uh, Mr. Chair, I am with you. I I cannot, I do not believe there is a distinction between gender. Um, however, I, I, I couldn't say for sure, um, but I do not believe that there was any distinction made between that. Very well. Uh, Representative Grossel. And just as, uh, you know, but just as Chief Wayne knows, uh, just like, uh, anybody else that has ever done this job, uh, you have different areas that uh, you, you run into different things. Uh, we've had applicants come from the Iron Range to work over in Northwest Minnesota where I worked. And it is a, it, it's a world apart as far as what you encounter uh, and the uh, types of things that are normal everyday duty in my area that were things that they only saw little bits and pieces of. So when these standards are going to be uh, uh, put together, I hope that you encourage the, uh, the post board or whoever's putting this stuff together to make sure that people are prepared for what they're going to encounter out there in the, in the law enforcement world. Like it or not, like it or not, um, I never ever wanted to have to go hands on with anybody. But there were those times where you had to do those things. And as to keep them safe, keep you safe, and to uh, affect an arrest or whatever that scenario may be. But they need to be prepared for that. And uh, so I, I, I hope you will encourage them to uh, not go light, uh, but make sure that people are, people are adequately prepared to go out into this world to, 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 to do this job. And thank you, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Grosso. I think uh, uh, good, good advice lies there. And I think uh, 
common values, uh, I think, are being expressed here. Uh, Chair Pintel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm Representative Grossel. Thank you for raising that. Um, uh, and I think it's an excellent point that, that policing can look at least a little different in different parts of the state. And uh, this, I believe that I, I know this intent here is to be laid over. And so I'll certainly uh, look into the league um, test uh, and, and just understand better uh, or, or confirm exactly what they do with that. I, I will just note, um, members, that's probably a good observation um, that policing does look different in different parts of the state. It's one of the reasons that um, it's so important that we um, I guess I can't resist uh, uh, Representative Gossel just thinking about, you know, uh, policing in my part of the state and the city may look different than your part of the state. This is why it's so important we all be talking with one another and sharing our best thoughts um, for that. Um, but, Mr. Chair, I, I really appreciate the time on the bill. I don't see other questions. I'm guessing it's time for me to wrap up. And so uh, I really appreciate um, this. And I think, uh, you know, if agencies are going to be having physical fitness tests, uh, we certainly want to make sure that they are, in fact, tied to the real requirements of the job. And to the extent that, say, push-ups, as Representative Grossel said, may have some time with the job, well, then we should be able to show that and then have that be part of the test. That's what this would do. Um, and I could then make sure that we're not um, uh, arbitrarily excluding people who may be quite good for police work and, in fact, may enhance uh, the safety of our communities, as uh, Representative uh, Long said. Mr. Chair, thanks so much for the consideration of the bill. Very well. Thank you, uh, Chair Pinta. I want to thank your uh, testifier, Captain uh, Wegener. Uh, Captain, you, you work for a uh, wonderful jurisdiction that abuts my uh, district uh, along the Mississippi River, and um, I spend quite a, a bit of time in your uh, your community. Thank you for your, your service to that wonderful community. Uh, with that, um, the chair um, lays over House File 3785 as amended for possible inclusion. Thank you, uh, Chair Pinto. Um, Folks, we're getting close. Um, next, we have um, House File 2725, Representative Edelson. Representative Edelson, you have a surprise visitor, uh, I believe, uh, with you uh, today. So uh, let me uh, begin by uh, uh, acknowledging your motion to refer House File 2725 to the Committee on Judiciary. And your bill is before us. And um, take it away. Um, Mr. Chair, actually, I think we were going to move it to Health and Human Services. Oh, okay. I should, I, boy, I'm just like running ahead of myself here. Okay. Huh? What's that, Representative John? <laughs> I think you meant to be muted. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Representative Ellison, your desire is to have 2725 be moved to. Health and Human Services, and then it would go to judiciary. Uh, okay. well, that, 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 that's the motion before us. Representative Ellison, your bill's before us. Uh, thank you. And just uh, thank you, members. Uh, Representative Albright and I have been working long hours on this bill. And so he is here to co-present with me. And I, I think um, Representative Albright, given that this is a late evening hearing. So um, Mr. Chair and members, House File 2725 is the result of comprehensive work by the Community Competency Restoration Task Force that was created by this legislature in 2019. This task force included 25 members and appointees from organizations and government entities, which included, and I'm just gonna name uh, not some, not all 25. <laughs> The Sheriff's Association, NAMI County's Attorney, uh, County Attorney, State Court Administration, DHS, Hospital Association, the Association of Minnesota Counties, and several of them are here today with us. Mr. Chair, I want to note that this legislation before you today is currently undergoing changes in negotiation with stakeholders to ensure we have full agreement to address this very serious gap in the state of Minnesota. This legislation seeks to what seeks to address what we know as gap cases, which Representative Albright will, will talk to you about uh, in just a moment here. The bill before you establishes standards to assess a person's competency to stand trial, and it places many provisions from Rule 20 into statute. It establishes a process for restoring a person to comp competency. It creates a forensic navigator position to work with defendants in the competency process and develop a plan to connect defendants to appropriate services. It also gives us gives judge more discretion to order treatment or hold individuals uh, who may may pose a risk to public safety. Mr. Chair, at this point, I would like to pass it to my uh, partner in this, Representative Albright, to speak to you more about gap cases. Representative Albright, welcome to our committee. I think it might be the first time uh, we've had you here, at least since I've chaired uh, this committee. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for uh, uh, 
uh, allowing us to present the House File 2725. And before I uh, make my remarks, I, I too would like to thank those uh, stakeholders that have uh, really partnered with us in, a, in a, a very strong bipartisan effort to get resolution to what I think uh, many would agree is, is a real problem with our judicial system in terms of competency. Um, Mr. Chair, and with your indulgence, um, over the past five years, the number of individuals who have been found incompetent to stand trial has risen steadily. This legislation and work by the tax force, along with myself and Representative Edelson, seeks to address what has been commonly referred to as gap cases. This is when a person is found incompetent to stand trial and a civil commitment proceeding is triggered. However, under current law, if a person doesn't meet the commitment standard, they cannot be required to participate in treatment. If the charges are for misdemeanors, the charges will be dismissed and many of these individuals will not receive help and may reoffend. The charges are for gross misdemeanors or felonies, Mr. Chair. The charges will be suspended. However, if a person does not meet the standard for commitment, prosecutors can only file notice and wait for a defendant to be restored to competency. Again, with no mechanism to ensure that a person receives treatment or restoration. The legislation that we are presenting to you, Mr. Chair, and members tonight seeks to ensure people get the care they need. They're held accountable. And at the same time, we address public safety concerns. I wanna thank you for the time that, that we are made available for this. And with that, I'll return, uh, yield my time back to Representative Edelson. Thank you, uh, Representative Albright. Representative Edelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Albright. Um, this is absolutely an issue as a state that we must address this session. By the next committee stop, I'm confident that we will make progress on what the final solution looks like. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to move to my testifiers. Uh, I have Sue Abderholden with NAMI and then also Bob Small with the county attorneys, but I'd also just wanna note for the record that we also have Ramsey County Attorney Tim Carey here, as well as Bill Ward from the Public Defender's Office to answer questions if, if committee members have them. Very well, thank you, uh, Representative Edelson and Albright. Uh, so next, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go to our testifiers and we'll begin with uh, Ms. Uh, Sue Abderholden. If you could state your name for the record and give us your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. Uh, the number of cases where a defendant was examined for competency increased 73% from 2014 to 2018. Judicial branch spending rose 40% during that same time period, topping off at over 6 million spent in 2018 on forensic exams alone. The strain on the system has made it so that Minnesotans cannot practically access our only state operated psychiatric hospital without going through the criminal court system. But we're also not serving people well. Of those where an evaluation was done, only 41 to 44% were actually found incompetent. Of those found incompetent, only 41% were committed or had a stay of commitment. And so we have what are called gap cases. So they include people who are found incompetent, but who did not meet the commitment standard. People found incompetent and are committed, but are discharged when no longer needing hospital level of care, but are not yet restored to competency. And then people who are unable to be restored to competency and don't meet the standards to be committed or to remain in jail. While I know there have been a couple of very high profile tragic cases, it's important to note that many of these people who are deemed incompetent are charged with nonviolent crimes, nonviolent misdemeanors. And just because someone has a mental illness doesn't mean that they are violent. People who are incompetent are not inherently more dangerous than anyone else who is released from jail. The rising cases and the backup at ANOCA led NAMI Minnesota coming to the legislature in 2019 to ask that you pass the bill to create a community competency restoration task force, which you did. And uh, Representative Edelson has already talked about who some of the 25 members were. 
um, we had a very huge task. We had to identify current services and resources that are available for individuals in the criminal justice system who have been found incompetent to stand trial, analyze the current trends of competency referrals by county and the impact of any diversion projects or stepping up initiatives, analyze selected case reviews and other data to identify risk levels of those individuals, service usage, housing status, and health insurance status prior to being jailed, research how other states address this issue, including funding and structure of community competency restoration programs and jail-based programs, and develop recommendations to address the growing numbers of individuals deemed incompetent. We met for two years and issued two reports, an interim and final report. We examine the process people go through before and after they are found incompetent. We tried to understand why there has been an increase in the number of people deemed incompetent. We looked at the sequential intercept model to determine what we could do to divert people from the criminal justice system. We looked at the gap cases and learned more about people's constitutional rights. We had presentations from people piloting community competency restoration programs. We heard from DHS about their policies and we heard from many others. We even conducted a survey of jails. I share this with you to help you understand that there was, this was a very active task force that took its charge very seriously. We did the research and we worked hard to develop a consensus on recommendations that were included in the final report, many of which are represented in this bill. I wanna mention that there have been three other work groups on this topic. There was the 2016 Minnesota Robina Institute, the 2019 Minnesota State Court Psych Services Work Group, and the 2020 National Work Group that included the Center, um, the uh, 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 Council of State Governments Justice Center. Um, I was actually uh, pleased to be a part of all three of those. And in many ways, the recommendations across all these groups are fairly, fairly consistent. We need to build the mental health system. We need to educate the judicial branch and criminal justice partners on mental health topics, including the community mental health system. We need to expand opportunities for diversion to treatment at all points in the criminal justice system, including after competency has been raised. We need to limit the competency restoration process to cases that are inappropriate for dismissal or diversion. We need to promote responsibility and accountability across systems, designating a specific person or team to follow the person. Improve efficiency at every step of the community um, competency restoration process with timelines or even competency dockets. Conduct evaluations and restoration in the community whenever possible and provide high quality and equitable evaluations and restoration services and ensure continuity of clinical care before, during and after restoration and upon release. The bill that is before you reflects many of these recommendations. I will note that there are other bills that have been introduced that would provide for the education of judges and create locked residential facilities in the community for competency restoration purposes. But this bill, this bill does carry out many of the recommendations. It does take Rule 20 and put most of it into statute. It allows the courts to order someone to treatment without being committed. This really addresses one of the huge gap cases, categories. By not requiring numerous competency exams when it's very unlikely that someone will ever be restored or for someone when it's a nonviolent crime and the timelines, the 90 days are such that it doesn't make sense to conduct an exam really saves us resources. We created timelines to ensure timely responses, but also made sure that we heard from um, the court examiners about what a reasonable timeline would be. And then we allow competency restoration to be done in the community and in jails. And then we appoint someone, we're calling them a forensic navigator, to actually create a plan for services and to connect the person to those services before they leave the jail or are dismissed and to follow along a person in the competency restoration process. I'm going to admit this is not a perfect bill. This is a huge issue, um, but it does take a huge step forward to address a problem experienced in Minnesota and actually across the country. We've continued to work with stakeholders on amendments since the bill was introduced and will continue to work towards creating a consensus. A consensus. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the task force and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Adler Holden, as usual. Uh, uh, very thorough and very um, 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 educational for all of us uh, to dive into uh, deep into 
be provided the frames and the elements uh, of a pretty complex but very necessary area of work. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we next have uh, Bob Small, the County Attorney Association. Doug Small, if you can come forward and um, um, state your name for the record, your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Robert Small. I'm the Executive Director for the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Um, and uh, first of all, I would like to uh, share with you that the County Attorneys Association has been looking and struggling and tackling this problem since at least 2017 with a dedicated group of our assistant county attorneys and county attorneys who work on these types of cases every day and see the devastating effect of the absence uh, of a uh, statutory fix to this problem and what kind of uh, real life public safety issues it creates. So our association uh, thanks Representative Edelson and uh, Representative Albright for their patience uh, and for uh, getting us together. We're at the table. We want to work with our partners to get something done that is good for everyone and is in the best interest of public safety. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, if there uh, is no problem, I'd like to turn it over to Tim Carey. Assistant Ramsey County Attorney who's worked so hard on this bill. Very well. Um, uh, Tim Carey, if you can come forward, state your name for the record and your testimony. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Tim Carey, and I'm an Assistant Ramsey County Attorney in the Civil Commitments Division. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and as Ms. Abderholden stated, um, our task force did work to eliminate the first gap, which is the people that are deemed incompetent on a criminal charge, um, but do not meet commitment criteria, so they can't be directed to receive care or treatment. Um, those people, their cases, and oftentimes their path to wellness um, languishes, and um, that spills over to impact families and communities where they live. Um, our bill, uh, the, the county attorney's um, recommendations, in addition to that bill, um, we also agree on the areas of um, allowing the criminal court to authorize treatment with neuroleptic medications, which would um, help increase um, the time it would take for most people with um, mental illness to recompensate and address their criminal charges or resolve them in some way. Uh, it also, as Ms. Abderholden stated, replaces uh, the rule with the force of a statutory fix. Um, what the County Attorneys Association hopes to do is to go a step further um, and close what we call the, the second gap. And those are people that have been deemed incompetent in criminal court, uh, are referred to a care plan um, under this the task force bill. Um, the forensic navigator would help a person um, access care, get um, the funding source in place for the care plan to meet their treatment needs. Uh, but if the person and the, the person could be conditionally released to that care plan from the criminal court um, custody hold. And if the person didn't follow that plan um, and had to be returned to court to answer to a violation of that conditional release plan, the criminal judge would have the authority to um, consider what the person's clinical care needs are, um, if there would be a need to change the plan in some way to better meet that person's needs. Um, but uh, the criminal judge could also do a public safety analysis. So um, we consider this a really important way to bridge the gap between meeting a person's care needs um, and also meeting the community safety needs. So if a person was simply not amenable to remaining sober or remaining med compliant or remaining engaged in the uh, treatment intervention that was there to serve their needs so that they could resolve their case, uh, the criminal court could direct the person into a jail-based competency restoration program or a locked um, or secure uh, inpatient competency restoration program. So that, that would be what I'd most like to highlight as a way to close gap number two. Um, this, this helps us pull apart from the commitment analysis, which is solely concerned with clinical care needs, um, we, we would get the best of both worlds under this recommendation so that we could 
meet the clinical care needs and also have an opportunity um, to, to direct someone who's not following a care plan into a higher, more structured environment to meet community safety needs. Very well, thank you, uh, Mr. Carey. Um, and Representative Edelson, we, we do have a, a public testifier. Um, and so I'm gonna call that person uh, forward and then we'll open this up. Uh, Commissioner Terrell Clark from Stearns County. Please state your name for the record and provide us with your testimony. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members. Um, Terrell Clark, uh, County Commissioner from Stearns County representing the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'm also a member of the task force and really appreciate all of the work that is being done so far here. Uh, particularly want to be thanking uh, Representative Edelson and Albright for the work um, and inclusion uh, with us as we attempt to make sure that this work gets done this session. Uh, so uh, many of the concerns um, that you've already heard uh, that the task force looked at um, are addressed within several different bills, including this one. Uh, we want to make sure that we are reinforcing that these issues are complicated and interconnected. And to be successful, the other bills and other issues must also be addressed, knowing that they are outside the purview of this bill. Uh, we do agree and believe that there's an immediate need to reform competency restoration and enact legislation that creates a path forward for Minnesota this session. So a lot of work has been already done, as you've heard. And at this point, we've got a couple of areas that we'd like to go ahead and address. Um, and as Representative Edelson said, we are working hard to resolve a few of these things. Uh, I think we're confident that that is possible uh, by the next stop, hopefully, that this bill makes. So I want to address a bit about pretrial and assuring statewide consistent administration and provision of services, as well as the need to make sure that resources are allocated uh, to be successful. We have concerns about the language regarding pretrial su supervision for those found to be incompetent to stand trial and also found unlikely to attain competency in the re reasonably foreseeable future. Many counties do not have the resource to provide pretrial services. The bill directs the court to determine whether the defendant needs pretrial supervision and gives the authority to place that person on a pretrial supervision with a willing entity. Currently, the bill does not appear to contain funding for supervision, which could last for up to three years for felony files. In addition, there is a question of who will administer and provide these new services. Competency restoration, education, and forensic work is still not settled. Um, as written, uh, it reflects, the bill reflects the task force recommendations that would have it set up through the courts. Um, AMC supports that or setting up something like the our office of the guardian ad litem. Want to clarify something because there are those who have thought perhaps maybe the counties could go ahead and just be handling this piece of it. There is often a fundamental misunderstanding about competency restoration and the interplay with civil commitment. Individuals can be deemed incompetent without being civilly committed. Also, after civil commitment has ended, a person may still be deemed incompetent to stand trial despite having their mental health issues stabilized. Or it might not be mental health issues that are primary barrier to competence. It might be cognitive or other issues that lead to them not being competent. For example, um, Colorado, which is one of the states the task force looked at uh, for their looking at their forensic navigators, uh, and has really provided a good basis for this legislation. It's offered through the judicial system and they report high percentages of persons served by the navigators have cognitive impairments and mental illness was secondary if present at all. We can get you more information about that if you are interested. So individuals are civilly committed to the DHS commissioner State is responsible for inpatient care while they're civilly committed. DHS then partners with counties for coordination or therapeutic treatment within the community while that person is still under commitment. 
DHS must approve the proposed placement. It is a coordinated effort. In order to do that coordination, the county social worker has to create a relationship of trust and understanding. Any reporting to the court would deteriorate that trust and create a conflict of interest for the social worker if the actions of reporting the court would end in incarceration, which is not beneficial to a client with mental health issues. Again, I want to note this is not a part of the task force recommendation, and it was not included in the bill. Thus, the conflict between the duty of care of a county social worker and a responsibility of a forensic uh, navigator could exist. So we want to make sure that there is a responsible entity to provide competency restoration services in the community to help clients understand the court process and ensure that the client is making progress on regaining competency. The only way to ensure that individuals are deemed incompetent, get the competency services they need uniformly throughout the state is to create a new program that lies at the state level. It's appropriate that this responsibility lie with the court or with the state, as with, uh, for example, the guardian ad litem program to ensure consistent programming and capacity throughout the state. Human services must be tailored to each community, but the judicial system is the same in each part of the state. Court procedures do not deviate from county to county, and therefore it's imperative that competency restoration be provided at the state level by an agency specialized in the niche field of competency restoration. We're committed to continue to working with the author and with other stakeholders on the bill to ensure this program is successful and meaningful legislation is passed this session. Thank you very much and certainly could stand for questions. We might have lost the chair. I think we did. Okay. We'll, we'll move on to questions from members. Representative Clyburn. Representative Claiborne, can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Oh, um, all right. Sorry, I, I must have not heard you in the beginning. So, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say um, I really value the work that this team uh, has put together and listening to you tonight as you testified, I can um, see that this is a really huge issue and a complicated issue and a massive undertaking. And there are many, many pieces that have to come together to make it work effectively. Um, so I just wanna say thank you again for the work that you do and that you have done and that you are gonna still continue to do. And uh, to Representative Edelson and Albright, Representatives Edelson and Albright, I look forward to seeing the product as it uh, reaches its final stage and to um, have an opportunity to review that again as it moves through the process. So thank you very much. I appreciate your work. It sounds like my, uh, our, it sounds like our vice, vice chair filled in. Thank you. <laughs> really You're welcome, Chair. Welcome back. Oh, I just ran out of juice on my uh, computer. My apologies to all. Um, let me get my list up. Um, and so, Representative Claiborne, I, I take it you're done. So, I, I do have uh, uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, a uh, couple things. First of all, I want to clarify where this bill was going to be going to. I believe it should be going to Human Services. Uh, Representative Johnson, that is where the author wishes it to go. Okay, uh, the uh, original motion made it. Uh, you had it. Uh, I had the wrong motion. Little, first. That's right. Yep, I just uh, clarifying to make sure it went right. went where it uh, goes where it needs to go. Yep. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in this bill. A lot of things that need that are still working on. Uh, this is something that uh, been needing to be done for decades, getting this figured out but it's very complicated. Uh, we've, uh, those of us in the field have called it the revolving door dealing with the same people time after time after time. Uh, they go in and uh, get their help there while they're institutionalized or they are, they have the, uh, they're for, uh, the courts can actually force them to take their medications once they get their medications taken care of and they're stable, they leave, they get off their meds and it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, 
until they get they find and we've dealt with some of the same people for 20 years on the same thing dealing with them every three to six months when we get off the medication uh, so something needs to be done i hope they can get this figured out uh, i don't think this uh, bill is re ready yet it still has a, a ways to go to get it done right just because we're coming to the end of the session, I, we don't, I don't believe we should push something through that's not right, especially in this, this type of circumstances, because we could actually do more harm than good if we don't get it right the first time. Um, I'm gonna reluctantly uh, vote this out of committee to Health and Human Services, but I think there's a lot of issues left, especially with some funding. Where, where's the funding gonna go if it's gonna be in probations uh, 36 months is a long time to be on probation. It's been very expensive. Uh, <clears throat> and there's going to be funding issues, the number that's going to be on there. We might not have enough staff, uh, what, if it's uh, the court side or, if it's, or the key state side or the county side, where the funding is going to go, how it's going to be paid for. Uh, we currently do not pay the county probation officers. Uh, the statutory requirement we're supposed to pay them now. We don't want to put more work on them until we get all that figured out. Uh, but like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote this to go to the next step, the next process. But I think it's going to have to come back to it sometime for funding issues. And we'll deal with it at that time because um, it's something that we need to do. But if we don't get it right, we shouldn't pass it this year. We got to make sure we get it right before we pass it on. A complex bill with a lot of a uh, lot of pieces here, um, and um, I um, uh, you certainly do want to get it right, uh, Representative Johnson. You know, I, I do see uh, Mr. Ward here, and I I, I know that you hadn't um, signed up to say anything, but you are here, um, and I, so I thought you know, um, Mr. Ward, if you wanted to say a few words of advice or um, observations, I would certainly welcome that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Bill Ward on the State Public Defender. I don't really have anything more to add than than uh, Sue did and 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 others and then you know Bob Spell and, and and Tim. And I recognize uh, Representative Johnson's statements around the cost, but, but the reality is, we're paying for it now. We're paying for it in the criminal court system. We're paying for it with victims and crimes. We're paying for it with the retail establishment. And what we're doing isn't working. And Representative Johnson said we've been working on this for decades. We've succeeded in no way whatsoever. Yes, there will be a heavy ticket price to this, and yes, it will make it better. And so I would just my statement for for you know all eternity is we got to spend the money right someplace. And getting folks into the system, looking at my office basically to help things, but we're at the bottom of the funnel. We have to keep people from coming into the system in the first place. And if they get into that system, someone with the expertise which is why we created the idea of this forensic navigator to help wind them through the system because i don't have that expertise nor do i have the staff to do that and having the experts do it instead of having them wind themselves through the system is the way to go thank you mr ward i thought it was important to have a public defense uh, voice at, uh, at this point in this hearing so i appreciate um, i appreciate that um i don't see anyone else and so representative albright and uh, Edelson, I'll, I'll have you uh, close us out, and and then we'll uh, move to the vote. Uh, well, I want to thank Representative Johnson for um, helping us move to the next committee. You have my commitment uh, that we will, really are working hard to make sure that we we do a good job. And I just, I Chair, I can't, and I think Representative Albright and I agree on this, we can't thank the people enough that are in this committee, um, from Tim Carey to Bill Ward to Ms. Abderholden and Bob um, Bob Small, we have the counties, we have everybody at the table, we've had numerous meetings and this this is building upon, you know, hours and hours they have met over the last year or so. Um, we have the right people at the table. I think that we are getting close and I just am so grateful for them, a lot of gratitude. And I think that we, at the end of the session, will have something that we'll, we can all be proud of. Uh, Representative Albright. Uh, Representative Edelson, Mr. Chair, um, this is a work uh, for the moment. Uh, and I, I think, um, as it was said by uh, Mr. Ward, if not now, when, and if not us, who, uh, this is an opportunity that I think builds upon 
the sacrificial work of uh, a number of tax forces. And as you've heard from the testimony, uh, I think uh, as a legal term, it has ripened. And so the opportunity is now to move it forward and uh, prove that that work uh, meant something uh, for the people that we serve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative uh, uh, Albright. Uh, kudos to you and to Representative Adelson in tackling a very difficult issue and our gratitude uh, to both of you and all your colleagues here um, who did the heavy lifting on this task force. Uh, thank you all. Uh, with that, um, Representative Edelson renews her motion. Let me make sure I get this right. Uh, we don't, we did not amend it uh, today. Uh, human services. Representative, uh, thank you. Representative Edelson renews her motion that House File 2725 be referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Aye. Chair Mariani, aye. Vice Chair Frazier. Aye. Vice Chair Fraser, aye. Lee Johnson. Aye. Lee, J Lee Johnson, aye. Representative Edelson. Aye. Represent Representative Edelson, aye. Reb Feist. Aye. Reb Feist, aye. Reb Grossel. Aye. Reb Grossel, aye. Reb Hollins. Aye. Reb, Reb Hollins, aye. Reb Hewitt. Aye. Reb Hewitt, aye. Reb Cleavorn. Aye. Rep. Cleavorn, aye. Rep. Rep. Long, aye. Rep. Long, aye. Rep. Lucero, Lucero, yes. Rep. Lucero, aye. Rep. Mueller, Mueller votes yes. Rep. Mueller, aye. Rep. Navani, Navani, aye. Rep. Navani, aye. Rep. O'Neill, O'Neill, aye. Rep. O'Neill, aye. Rep. Pinto, aye. Rep. Pinto, aye. Rep. Poston, aye. Rep. Poston, aye. Rep. Raleigh, Raleigh, aye. Rep. Raleigh, aye. Rep. Vang? Aye. Rep. Vang, aye. Rep. Shung? Aye. Rep. Shung, aye. And that concludes roll call with 19 ayes. Very well. With 19 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. And House File 2725 is referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Thank you again, uh, Representative uh, Edelson and Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Members, we're, uh, we're at our last bill, um, and we have my good friend, Representative Erdahl here with, Rep with uh, House File 2970, and Representative Fraser, I'm going to avail myself of you again, sir. Um, uh, no, actually, we're going to be laying this over, so no need to do that. Uh, the chair uh, uh, calls forward House File 2970, uh, and our intention is to lay this over for possible inclusion. Representative Erdahl. Your bill is before us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate you hearing the bill. Uh, you've had a lot of uh, complex, complicated uh, bill discussions uh, this evening, and uh, uh, I have a simple little bill for you. <laughs> um, the Minnesota Compact for Adult Offender Supervision governs the process of transporting an offender on supervision in Minnesota from another state and returning the offender to Minnesota. The compact requires that the Commissioner of Corrections shall oversee, supervise, and coordinate the interstate movement of offenders. In Minnesota, the Department of Corrections has tasked local county sheriffs with the responsibility of returning Minnesota probationers from out of state to Minnesota. However, the DOC has not been compensating the counties for this duty. This bill amends the interstate adult offender uh, supervision statute to appropriate up to $250,000 each year from the Department of Corrections budget to reimburse county sheriffs for expenses related to the transport of probationers from out of state to Minnesota. Reimbursement is based upon a fee schedule agreed to by the DOC and the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. Transport expenses may not be reimbursed to sheriffs for the transport of probationers from locations that are within 250 miles of the county arranging for pickup of the probationer. Local sheriffs have met with the DOC to try to work out this issue. This bill represents the results of the work of the sheriffs and the DOC. Governor Walls has included $250,000 in fiscal year 2023 in his supplemental budget recommendations to the DOC and added the amount to the tails for this purpose. The DOC supports this bill. So 
that's uh, my introduction. I, I believe I have a testifier or two. Indeed, I see uh, uh, Meeker County Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Brian Cruz. If you can come forward, sir, state your name for the record and give us your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Sure, Chair Mariani and members of the committee. My name is Brian Cruz and I'm the Sheriff for Meeker County. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank Representative Erdahl for, and his colleagues for bringing this bill forward. I'd also like to thank the Minnesota Department of Corrections for working with the Minnesota Sheriff's Association on this issue, and we do appreciate their support on this. And thank you, Chair Mariana, for bringing this uh, bill forward here today. Um, I'm not here only as the Sheriff of Meeker County, but I'm also here representing the Minnesota Sheriff's Association, which is the 87 elected sheriffs in Minnesota. And I'm here to testify in support of, of this bill. So briefly, uh, Senate, uh, Representative Erdahl did touch on this, but um, we're here to talk about the impact that the Interstate Compact has on the county um, government. So the Interstate Compact, as Representative Erdahl said, is something that the state of Minnesota has entered into with other states as a means of returning those on probation um, to the state controlling that probation. For instance, if I, if I commit a crime in Minnesota and I'm from Florida, after the disposition of the case, with permission, I can return to Florida and serve out my probation. Um, if an issue arises or if I, if I um, violate that probation um, and I need to come back to court in Minnesota, the Interstate Compact is the, is the uh, mechanism that's used to, to do that. Uh, sheriffs across the state of Minnesota have traveled throughout the country to pick up these violators and bring them back to the proper court of jurisdiction. The Sheriff's Office has no role in the decision-making when determining if, a, if someone can reside outside of, the, outside of the state of Minnesota while on probation. And um, as sheriffs, we are not a party to the Interstate Compact. It's an agreement with the state of Minnesota. However, uh, as was pointed out, the task uh, to return these individuals has fallen on the Minnesota sheriffs. Uh, in my county alone, we get several leads throughout the year, and there is a financial burden to complete this task. I recently had an individual return from out of state that was uh, a cost us uh, approximately $3,000 to get that done. And I've had several others that have uh, have ranged in cost from $1,200 to $1,500. So as you can tell, it's it's not a it's not a cheap venture to, to do this. Um, and ha being a smaller county, this definitely has an impact on my budget versus a, a larger county who might be able to absorb it a little easier. It also has an impact on our staffing because if we do the transport ourselves, we're sending a couple of deputies with. There's hotel costs, there's um, uh, vehicle expenses, or maybe plane tickets or what have you. And due to staffing issues, I've also used transport companies and, and they're just expensive. There's, so there really is not a cheap way to do this. Um, sheriffs have been doing this transports um, all along and at the direct cost of the county, as which was pointed out. We will continue to do these transports. We're just seeking state reimbursement to do these transports. And as noted, uh, we do have the support of the Minnesota DOC on this as well. So on behalf of all the sheriffs in the state of Minnesota, I'm here to, today to support this bill. I appreciate your time tonight. And I'd like to again, thank Representative Erdahl for bringing this forward and his colleagues, the Minnesota DOC, uh, and you Chair Mariani and, and the members of this committee. And I will stand for questions. Very well, thank you, Sheriff. We appreciate your, uh, your presence with us here uh, today as well. Uh, Representative Erdahl, we'll open this up for uh, questions and comments. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, last night I received word that uh, uh, DOC Commissioner Schnell wished to testify. I don't know if he's on or not, but uh, uh, if he isn't, uh, he did express support and uh, the desire to testify. I Mr. Chair, I am here. Uh, oh, there you are. You know, I don't see you on the list here, but uh, uh, good to see you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, please come forward. Well, well thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, Rep Representative Verdal, we want to thank you for, for bringing this forward, Sheriff, as well. Um, we, we are here to express support of this. We've had the opportunity to work with the sheriffs on this issue uh, over the course of, of time. Uh, earlier tonight, uh, the committee started out really talking of, about House File 3308, which had to do with some technical changes to uh, the, the compact uh, agreement and uh, which a, a number of members of the committee uh, sit on uh, and participate in. To provide some context around this issue, in 2018, uh, just about 3,000 people with criminal sentences that originated in our state uh, were transferred, had their trans supervision transferred to another state. And when a person um, uh, under supervision in that other state absconds or, or uh, violates, uh, is convicted of a new uh, felony offense, 
under the compact agreement, a nationwide uh, warrant is required and that person must be returned uh, to the state of, of uh, sentence responsibility, in this case, uh, Minnesota. Um, and the cost is uh, for transporting those persons if they're on supervised release. The state uh, Department of Corrections covers those costs. But in cases, uh, as the sheriff mentioned, where they're put on felony probation, uh, the cost uh, the cost of uh, transporting those uh, folks back to Minnesota has fallen on the sheriffs. And I would remind uh, members that that uh, one of the things I think as Representative Johnson talked about earlier is that in Minnesota, that that from the standpoint of felony supervision, the state really bears uh, currently the fundamental financial obligation of cost borne um, uh, for the supervision and the management of uh, probationers or people under supervision uh, across our state. And that would include those subject to uh, interstate compact. Um, and, and so these, as the sheriff pointed out, these uh, transports can be, be quite costly. And, and given the fact that we are a participant uh, in, in the compact, which all 50 states are, uh, ultimately, there are requirements that we have to comply with, uh, lest we could become subjected to uh, certain penalties by uh, the compact itself. Um, this request we know will help other counties, particularly those, as the sheriff talked about with, with small budgets, um, uh, who, to comply with the, all the federal rules. Um, and um, in turn, these, these nationwide warrants uh, get issued in a timely man manner, and subjects are, are then returned to Minnesota in a timely manner uh, for uh, the, the transaction or the business around justice uh, to, be, to be managed. The DOC will monitor and track the number of these uh, nationwide warrants issued and the number of individuals that are required back. Um, and as, uh, as was mentioned, the governor, this will be included in the government, the governor's supplemental budget request. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would stand for any questions the uh, committee members may have, but we do stand in full support of this. Very well, thank you, uh, Commissioner Stahl. Thank you for uh, uh, working arm in arm with our, our county sheriffs on this important issue. Um, all right, we do have a, a couple of questions. I'll start with uh, Representative Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, good late evening to you. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions. Uh, one, well, actually, one question. Two parts. How many um, transports are made each year in Minnesota? And then, do we have an average cost per transport? And uh, Representative Verdal, there might be a question for our Sheriff and or Commissioner. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, that would be a question, Mr. Chairman, for uh, maybe Commissioner Schnell or or the Sheriff. <laughs> All right, I'll, uh, I'll start with you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for that, that question. Um, I, I would just say, I don't know the exact number. I know that that the Department of Corrections itself, from the interstate compact transport, we do uh, hundreds of transports every year outside of the state of Minnesota uh, to bring people back who are on subject to supervised release. And I would, uh, and you know, as the sheriff pointed out, it's not uncommon for this to happen in, in counties. Uh, generally speaking, it's certain offenses that are going to require that level of of, uh, of, a, of a nationwide uh, warrant to be issued. Um, and uh, but you know th there are many hundreds of these every year across the state. Um, but but many of them, most often, most commonly, they are often in neighboring, generally in neighboring states. You know, Illinois, Wisconsin, um, Iowa, uh, those sorts of things. But we do get some that, you know, are Florida, Texas, California. Um, certainly there are. But I, I can find out the exact number, but there's a number every year. Uh, that might be, uh, and they might be helpful. And I'll probably uh, pop up on a fiscal note uh, uh, yes. inquiry uh, down the line here. Representative Raleigh. Yeah, thank you. And the second part of the question, Mr. Chair, was uh, do we have an idea of what the average cost per transport is? And as Commissioner Sn uh, Shell just said, you know, some of these are probably going to be uh, short distance, some of them are going to be long distance. Just wondering if there's, and, and Mr. Chair, you're going to exactly to the, the question that I'm driving towards, and that's what's going to be the, you know, the financial impact of this. We know that we've got $250,000 that have been allocated um, what I'm trying to do is get a sense for, is this going to be enough? Is, are, we, are we chipping away at this or are we actually solving it, Mr. Chair? 
Yeah, well, and, and Sheriff, I do recall you uh, sharing that it's it's not necessarily cheap and you can kind of range. Uh, I think I heard you um, uh, throw out a, a one figure in the over a thousand um, easily. Um, and, and you're just one county. Um, and I think you also said you had several uh, just last year alone. Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Chair um, and Representative Raleigh. Um, so I don't know what the average is. I know on the high high end, it was $3,000. Three thousand. Um, I think, yeah, I think the average for us is that $1,200 to $1,500 um, mark. Um, if you're using a transport company, it's easily that $1,200 mark. Um, we have transports, yes, that are the next the next state over. Obviously, that would be a little less because we can just send a deputy really quickly. Um, so it's a matter of, of of those costs. But when we're talking the thousand dollars and up, we're talking um, states that are a ways away. Um, we currently have six of these pending. Um, we get probably three or four a year, um, just off the top of my head, thinking back on these. Um, so I, I would say a safe bet is that thousand to two thousand dollar area is probably a typical cost. Um, to re return somebody to the state of Minnesota. Um, and you're not a, a, a heavily populated state, so you can imagine um, some, or rather county, uh, you can imagine what the cost might be in some other counties. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll certainly uh, revisit this when uh, uh, finance time and we, uh, when we pull up this uh, fiscal note on this. All right, uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, members. I'll uh, keep this brief as the time is getting late and I think we all want to get out of here. Uh, Representative Erdahl, thank you for bringing this forward. I think it's a great idea. Uh, the counties are getting stuck with bills on uh, for things that uh, actually should have been the state responsibility because the state entered in these compacts. I myself have done the 14 hour drive one way to spend a night in a super eight to pick up a person at the jail to drive 14 hours home the next morning for that later that day. Um, it, it's not fun, it's not enjoyable sitting, and, it, and you have to pick your stops very carefully because you have a prisoner in the back of your car that you have to find a place that he can have, get something to eat, also to uh, use the facilities. Um, and you wanna do it in a way that uh, usually is discreet uh, for his own, uh, uh, just so, it, he uh, seems like a normal person walk, going to the rest area restaurant. Uh, so we try to do the best we can. The tough part is it is a burden to the uh, counties and to the county's budgets. Um, the number per year can vary dramatically from a few to, uh, I think my county did one one year, three, one year later they did 10. It, you don't know how it, what's going to happen and what, what's going to go on. It varies year to year. But unfortunately, the, it's the uh, EOC put it on the sheriffs to do this, but they didn't give any funding with it. So I, I think this is a good thing to get some funding to help the counties take care of this issue. As a lot of it, it is a DOC issue, but the sheriffs are taking the blunt for responsibility. So thank you, uh, Representative Erdahl, uh, for bringing this forward. Very well. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Representative Rudolph, uh, give us some closing thoughts and then the chair will move the latest over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate again the uh, ability to uh, testify before you. Actually, it, it's good just to uh, be in a committee that you are chairing again, uh, Chair Mariani. Uh, well, it's been a few years. Uh, we I guess, had a lot of years together. Indeed. Uh, this is an important issue uh, our small counties especially around the state to their budgets this is a big deal and so we're uh, hopeful that uh, you will uh, include it in your omnibus bill thank you very well thank you representative Randolph. thank you um, uh, sheriff uh, uh, cruz um, and uh, commissioner Snell. Um, a good idea that um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to take care of this year uh, with that uh, the chair moves um, uh, the chair lays over House File 2970 uh, for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. Um, and with that, members, that concludes our, our hearing. Uh, we're uh, eh, 40 minutes early, um, but it doesn't feel early to me. So uh, hopefully you all have a good 
a restful night and uh, we will catch you, um, uh, catch you, okay. we'll reconvene um, um, at a regular time uh, on Thursday. With that, uh, this committee stands adjourned.